declare a vacation easy go recreation come with me for a ride on a slow carousel get away from the hurry hustle bustle and worry we'll relax when we ride on the slow carousel just imagine we're kids again on an old-fashioned merry-go-round tuning in to the happy calliope sound If it sounds kind of crazy, taking time to be lazy, just remember the moments to treasure are few.
Welcome everybody. So nice to see all these happy faces in our um, chambers today. Uh, welcome to our Tuesday, March 8th City Commission work session. We will call this meeting to order. Um, Nikki, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Nikki. <clears throat> okay, uh, just a, you know, just for minor business of the day, we, I haven't heard it from anybody on commission discussion, but we did get in um, a request from the city attorney to do an update under her um, thing. So I'm just letting you know. Um, we'll move on to presentations. Our first presentation is Women's History Month proclamation. I will turn that over to Vice Mayor Kynes. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to say yesterday that all of us attended a wonderful International Women's Day luncheon, all of us, and um, it was uh, by the chamber, and it was put together by Fawn Germer, who's a very well-known writer, and just missed the Pulitzer Prize by a tiny bit four times, so very, very well renowned. Um, and we had four extraordinary women speakers, one of our own, Mo Franey. She did a great job. We had Linda Boosinger, uh, George Ann Bissett, and Tracy Alexander Bryant. And it was a wonderful day celebrating women. And now I will read the proclamation. Whereas women of every race, class, and ethnic background have, have made historic contributions to the growth and strength of our nation in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. And whereas throughout our nation's history, women have been pioneers in all areas of society, from arts and sciences to medicine and public service. And whereas women have dramatically influenced our public policy and the building of viable institutions and organizations, and whereas from championing basic human rights to ensuring access and equal opportunity for all Americans, women have led the way in establishing a strong and more democratic country. And whereas the knowledge, skills, and abilities of women contribute to a more robust workforce and a more prosperous economy. And whereas women of every race, class, and ethnic background served as early leaders in the forefront of every major progressive social change movement, and women have and currently serve our country courageously in the military. And whereas we remember the great women who fought for suffrage and advanced our democracy. And whereas we remember and honor our Dunedin women, such as, Eliz such as Elizabeth Skinner and those in the Women's Club who pioneered the way for women in our city. Now, therefore, I, Deborah Kynes, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the mayor, Julie Ward Bajowski, as mayor of the city of Dunedin, and on behalf of the entire city commission, do hereby proclaim March 2022nd as Women's History Month, and we encourage all residents to celebrate our pioneering Dunedin women and the vital contributions of women to our nation's history. Vice Mayor, thank you for letting me accept this. Um, Dunedin should be so proud to be the first city in Dunedin, uh, in Florida, to receive the National Votes for Women trail marker in honor of Elizabeth Skinner Jackson. That marker is on Edgewater Drive, the former site of Library Hall, uh, where Skinner hosted suffrage meetings. Dunedin has a rich history of strong, inspirational women from Vivian Skinner Grant, the mother of Dunedin, mm -hmm. to all our philanthropic groups that are predominantly women, such as the Garden Club, the Youth Guild, the Friends Junior League, and to our current mayor, 
the first female mayor in 26 years. <laughs> so sweet. And the third since Dunedin's existence to our first female city manager. To celebrate Women's History Month, uh, the Dunedin Public Library is hosting a Florida Humanities Council Florida Talks grant. We have Dr. Peggy McDonald on Friday, March 22nd, at, or March 25th at 3 p.m. And she'll be talking about Florida's fight for women's suffrage and she'll be speaking a little bit on Elizabeth Skinner as well. So we hope you can join us. Um, it is March 25th at 3 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis, and thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Kynes. Um, now we'll move on to a presentation for Florida's Bicycle Month, and we'll turn that over to Commissioner Gao. Uh, thank you. I have a point of order, though. <laughs> why, why, are, why is Jeff the one doing it? <laughs> He's our bicyclist. <laughs> Mr. Jeff, bicycle. Jeff will bicycle, Mr. bicycle. To, uh, <laughs> to City Hall on any given day. I love it. I, and I, in a and peanut butter and, and jelly outfit. He, yeah. He did a peanut butter and jelly outfit, too. I, I did. And actually, I was riding here this morning and, and broke my glasses. And so I, oh, had to, I had to turn around and get, so I had to go get glasses, la, 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 so it was easier, easier to drive. Uh, but before I do this, I did want to acknowledge that it is International Women's Day today. And so I know that we have made great strides uh, in equitable um, comparisons. But um, we still have a long fight to go, but I just want everybody to recognize who's on the dais and that I'm just thrilled to be with the women that I am who I consider colleagues and mentors. So thank you, ladies, very much. And the colors of the day are gold, purple, and white. So I, I did my best. <laughs> so, so thank you. And uh, speaking of progress that's being made, uh, it is Florida Bicycle Month. And so if I could ask... Uh, David Gutenplan to come forward to accept this, who is with the Florida Department of Transportation, and how exciting that we, that uh, the Florida Department of Transportation is now uh, thinking bicycles and hopefully will become bicycle-centric sometime in the next century. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, Working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, David. Um, Florida Bicycle Month. Whereas bicycle plays an important role in the lives of millions of U.S. citizens, residents, and visitors by providing a means to travel to work, school, and parks, and is, pop and is a popular form of recreation and exercise. And whereas bicycling helps encourage ecotourism and historical and environmental preservation through recognizing the importance of our nation's natural resources, and whereas bicycling promotes health and wellness and is an important part of encouraging all citizens to develop habits of physical activity to become or stay fit, avoid obesity, and reduce the risk of many chronic diseases and conditions. And whereas bicycle and pedestrian safety has been elevated to a critical priority in the U.S. Department of Transportation to reduce fatalities and serious injuries on the nation's roadways, and whereas the U.S. Department of Transportation, Forward Pinellas, and the City of Dunedin have adopted goals, objectives, and policies to develop a multimodal transportation system that supports transportation alternatives, including bicycling. And whereas the recognition of Florida Bicycle Month will raise awareness of bicycling and ultimately promote physical activity and healthy lifestyles, by elevating bicycles as a more widely accepted choice of transportation. And whereas the city of Dunedin residents and visitors engaged in bicycling as an equitable, viable, and environmentally sound form of transportation and an excellent form of physical activity and recreation, and the city plans and recommends projects to make bicycling more accessible and promote comprehensive community education efforts Aimed at, improve, aimed at improving bicycle safety. Now, therefore, I, Jeff Gow, by the virtue of the authority vested in me by the mayor of the city of Dunedin and on behalf of the entire city commission, do hereby proclaim March as Florida Bicycle Month in Dunedin and encourage residents and visitors to celebrate bicycling as a sustainable and healthy form of transportation. So uh, that's awesome. I, uh, I work for DOT, obviously, and, uh, 
passion is cycling. I've raced all over the world and professional cyclists and I was hit by a car, almost killed, came back and was like, all right, got to do something, use my master's in civil engineering and join the DOT to try to make the road safer. So this is, this is uh, near and dear to my heart. So it's cool to see you guys doing it. It's cool to be here. I live in uh, Oldsmar and used to live in Clearwater. So it's local and uh, lived all over the place. But uh, let me give a little funny story for you guys since <laughs> I'm here. So this morning I got up early, did 60 miles before I was going to come here. And then I was like, all right, I'll go home, take a like shower. Like we all do. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you hear how he just uh, just kind of came out of his mouth? Off <laughs> yeah. and off? I, I was going to say off. only 60? That's it? 60? Really? So no big deal, right? And then... Um, Late day. Late I go, I take a shower, I'm about to drive over here, and my wife looks at me, where's your keys? I'm like, what do you mean, where's my keys? I'm about to leave to go over there. She's, I forgot that I loaned her boss my car. <laughs> Oh, no. Because he's in town for Charleston, and I never use a car because I ride to work every day. So, so you rode here? So I was like, all right, looks like I'm riding here, too. So There you go. Anyway, kind of funny story, and uh, oh. just From old let you know that I, I care <laughs> about it, and it's awesome to see you guys recognizing it, and it's nice. I got to say, the DOT, every single office is we're really working on safety. It's, it's insane how much it's a part of our culture. It's not going to happen overnight, but we're working on it step by step, and every single little thing makes a difference. And Saturday, we got the Skinner Boulevard Trail Crossing Project. Yep. We're going to do an event uh, over here at the barbecue place. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've ridden up and down the Pinellas Trail a million times, and it's, it's nice to see Dunedin really get behind the Pinellas Trail, and I love it, so... Thank There's you. my story too. And here's a copy of the proclamation if you'd like to come around and yeah. I've got a thousand of them, so sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so now it's time for citizen input. Anybody wishing to come forward and speak to any topic that's not already on the agenda? Please come forward, give us your name and address for the record, and you'll get three minutes. My with name the is Susan Klupel, K L U E P P E L. I live at 2308 Watrous Drive in Dunedin. I don't have any funny stories for you today, mm. but <laughs> I am compelled to return again to this body to speak about tennis in Dunedin. I speak for myself, although there are several people who will identify themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I play tennis with who support what I have to say. Um, there have been presentations made to you people that contain conflicting facts and conflicting opinions. And it's about the number of tennis players that are out there and the condition of the courts primarily. Um, you are the ones who have to make the decision. And, uh, and you appear to all want to make the right decision. But I, in my humble opinion, you can't make a good decision without good information. So um, I doubt anyone in this room, unless I'm totally wrong, is an expert on constructing tennis courts. Certainly not me. I get my information from an expert on construction. But I am no expert. As a trial lawyer, when we had issues about facts or, or opinions, We'd hire experts, and they'd spend days testifying in the court of law, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Except for when I got smart, and I'd call the opposition and say, OK, let's agree on one expert. So I humbly plead with you people, one of you people anyway, to contact an expert on the issue of constructing tennis courts. Find out how a good uh, tennis court is made, and how it's maintained properly for the safety of us tennis players and, frankly, also the, the pickleballers. Um, tennis players want their courts back. It's just clear that we're, we're asking for it to be back. The pickleball ballers will get their new courts, and we want ours back. I brought pictures to show in the last two weeks, 18 people have shown up at the uh, Virginia Street courts. And um, we only have two courts over there. 
this is this happened Sunday and it happened Thursday and it happens usually four to six people waiting. But this was ten people waiting. Um, so we, we we want even more courts built. But in the meantime, we like to have make make sure that the courts that are there are well maintained and are safe for our players. And that's it. That's Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, they, uh, yeah, give it to the city clerk. She'll pass them around. Yeah, I'll pass them around. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Lynn Osborne, 671 Whisper Cove Court, Dunedin. I would like to read a letter my husband wrote to the commissioners. I don't know if our mayor has heard it, but um, Dunedin commissioners, of late, there has been a lot of discussion regarding building new pickleball courts, but the needs of tennis players seem to have gotten lost in the sauce. I'm a tennis player and I harbor no ill will toward pickleball players. Whether you play tennis or pickleball, we are all out there to get some exercise and have fun. And I believe everyone deserves equal opportunity. Right now, both sports are underserved here in Dunedin. At times, there are a lot of people waiting for court time for both sports due to lack of courts. According to the Florida Bureau of Economic and Business Research, Florida's population is projected to grow to 24,470,000 by 2030, and Pinellas County is projected to grow to 1,063,400 by 2030. 2030 is not far away, and already there are too few courts for both tennis and pickleball players. It would be naive to think that all these people will be pickleball players and there won't be any tennis players among them. It's easy to see from these statistics that demand for court time is only going to grow and we would like to see Dunedin commit to build both new tennis and pickleball courts. Sincerely, Charles Osborne. Personally, I am very frustrated about the tennis courts, tennis court situation. This is my third month coming to speak at the commission about Dunedin tennis courts. We are told you want to hear from Dunedin residents about we want, what we want done with the allotted monies. But reading the Dunedin Beacon, it seems like the decisions have already been made. The pool, pickleball courts, and golf course are all that are mentioned. If I am wrong, then let's do something in writing. One frustrated Dunedin resident. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so Jenna, oh, you want to come? I apologize. Come on down. Give us your name and address for the record. Lucia Schneck, 883 Skylock Drive South, Dunedin. Um, I came here three and a half years ago, and uh, I discovered a less than a mile from my home those wonderful Virginia Street courts. And some would say I actually, over the past three years, was able to use them to improve slightly my game. However, um, what I'm here to tell you about is a little bit of the history. Not long, one quick story. Um, I understand that there has been a regular, informally organized group of tennis players, most, all ages, moving more towards senior, um, uh, at those courts since the mid-90s. And at that time, um, it was a wonderful experience. We still have one of our players here that um, was here at that time. And um, I will ask Dottie later maybe to stand up. However, my point is that that was organized by John Bauer Sox. And I recall, I've been told many times that when a tiny little plaque was asked to be posted because of the great community contribution he made by organizing and teaching at that site for so many years, the city denied him long before there were pickleballers on the scene. Then um, this past year, um, in 21, frankly, I think it was 21, yeah. Um, one of our members from that time fell on the court, hit his head, and lost half his brain. 
And he was also instrumental. His name was Doug Winther. And he, he was also in, instrumental in keeping the group going, keeping it organized, linking it with other parts of the city, et cetera, et cetera. And when we wanted to do a tiny acknowledgement to him, we were also denied. And so what I'm asking only today is the contribution that this free group that the city never had to spend a dime on to this community atmosphere and to the seniors in this community, keeping them active without spending a ton of money on a huge center, which I am not saying you shouldn't have it, it's very important, but this is also very healthy um, and very necessary and very utilized. So I would say that historically, you really do have a precedent for maintaining tennis in the best sense, tennis with workable courts, maintained courts, and in important locations. And we're all for pickleball. And you heard my friend here, Lynn, say she's a pickleballer, but she's a tennis player. We need them all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guys, let's not, let's, please, let's not do that. Okay, anybody else want to come forward? Okay, so Jennifer, do you want um, just to reiterate what uh, we have in our budget and when, when we think that might happen? Absolutely. If you don't mind, Mayor, I'd also ask Vince to come up to talk sure. a little bit about maintenance because I know there's a question on, on maintenance of the courts. And actually, the, the court that was of concern to uh, your constituents was up for maintenance this year yeah. in the regular cycle. Uh, well, I, I do think, just to interject, I think that's important. The maintenance of the court would not be in the ARPA funds. That's in our annual budget. So that happens on a, our maintenance of any recreation, um, playgrounds, basketball courts, all of those things. That's something that happens on an annual basis out of our general fund. So right, correct. It, it wouldn't be part of the ARPA fund. And it's cyclical as well. So uh -huh. it's cyclical as well. It, right. goes, it moves around. So Vince one, is going to address that. It's scheduled already. So as far as the funding goes for the pickleball courts, it was originally um, uh, scheduled for, I think it was 2025, in our Penny for Pinellas funds. The, uh, the, the commission was approached by residents who were concerned, both tennis and pickleball court users, who were concerned about uh, not having the space and the time that they need on the courts. And so the city commission moved the, the construction of the courts forward, I think it's $400,000, Vince? Yes, 400. Forward in the ARPA funding to be done essentially as soon as possible. So the logical place to put uh, the, the courts is Eagle Scout Park, uh, adjacent to the existing tennis ball courts, six pickleball courts. We are uh, currently doing some due diligence as far as the, as the drainage goes in that area because you're actually increasing the impervious, that's the, the solid ground, if you will, in that bar park by quite a bit. So we need to look at the drainage uh, in that park before we construct those courts. And that exercise is, is underway at, at this time. Also, uh, we are uh, master planning Sterling Park, as you know. The commission committed to the Fairway St Estates community that we would get their, their input and master plan Sterling Park, which is a logical place for pickleball courts. But first of all, we have to go to the community there as well. And so that's also uh, something that we have scheduled and that we're going to move forward with. So Mayor, I'm gonna ask Vince to speak to uh, standard maintenance of the tennis courts, if you will. Thank you, Jennifer. Vince Gizzi, Parks and Recreation Director, and um, I think you hit it right on the head of exactly what the plans are for both those park facilities, pickleball and the possibility of a dog park. Um, we have this year, in the budget this year, and we're working on getting uh, quotes right now, uh, $30,000 to uh, upgrade the, the courts at Highlander, and then in next year's budget, 23, we have another $30,000 to upgrade the courts at, at Fisher. Um, the Eagle Scout courts were just done, I believe, back in 2019. We try to do them every five years. Uh, we're also doing a survey of the courts. We're doing a lifetime survey. We have been for the last three weeks uh, on the amount of play that pickleball gets and the amount of play that tennis gets. So we have several different staff members, seven days a week, uh, three or four times a day, uh, mostly the prime time for both pickleball and tennis to see if people are waiting, uh, to see how many tennis players are out, to see how many pickleball players are out. So we should have a, a report. We, was hoping, we were hoping to keep that open for about a month. So 
in the next week or so, we should have uh, a, a report that we could forward on to our city manager. And what do you intend to do with those numbers? Well, we, we want to <laughs> determine if we, do need, we if we do need more tennis courts. Right now, we do have 11. Um, I mean, I've heard seven, I've heard nine. Uh, we do have a tennis pro that does uh, spend a lot of time on one of the courts at, at Fisher. But we do have 11 tennis courts, and there, three of those courts are dual use. Uh, one tennis court can make two pickleball courts. So it gives us six pickleball. And pickleball is exploding. It's a very, very popular port, court, sport. But you're in, the reason you're in looking at the numbers, essentially, is to determine if we need more if tennis courts. If we need courts. more of either, and what, and what does that look like? Yes. That's correct. That is right. OK. Just one point of clarification. When we do the Sterling Park, and we get community input, that's not just Fairway. That's community. That's correct. It's the entire community. Yeah, we'll it's advertise similar, the community yeah, meeting. Not. Absolutely. That's a good point, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, you know, Vince, that's, that was the question I asked. Mm -hmm. How many tennis courts do we actually need to serve our population of tennis players, and how many pickleball courts do we need for now in the future to serve our pickleball players? And it shouldn't be one or the other. It should be both. We're, we should look at both and say, what's the actual population we're serving, and are we... Uh, do we have the the appropriate amenities for them to pursue their sports? Yes. Um, we also have National Parks and Recreation has standards, and the standards were drilled down to Dunedin when we did our uh, strategic pl <coughs> plan back in 2015. I know that was six or seven years ago, uh, and the number was for a city of our size, there should be nine tennis courts. We do have 11. And again, we're monitoring them to see if people are waiting to play and who's waiting. And in pickleball, they have a different type of rotation where if, if eight people or 10 people come to, the, to play and there's four in a court and they set up two courts, they, they rotate people in and out. Where mostly in, in the tennis world, two people go, four people go, they play tennis for the hour. There could be some people on the side waiting to, to play. So we are doing this real-time study in a popular uh, tourist season. Uh, we started about three weeks ago, and we should have a report to see if we really do need a, more tennis courts. I'd like to make a comment, if I may. Yeah. Um, so I find this very interesting. Um, we had a group that came before us and asked us for information and raised a question and raised an issue. Uh, I know I spoke with the city manager weeks ago about this, and she was all in this and said, yes, let's get staff on this. And so staff has been doing what it is that we would want them to do to collect this information. They continue to come back and say, hey, we need this. And regardless of what the numbers are, the city manager said that, that she would be looking at, that the city would look into this. And so we still have to decide what happens with that then. So it's great that they came back in and give us their input and that we're now gonna seek additional input and as everybody knows, I was heavily involved in the tennis industry. So um, tennis is a great sport. We get people here that really care about it. So I think it's great and great that Vince is, is jumping all over this with the staff and making sure that we get the, get the correct information. Thank you very much, city manager. That worked out good. Thank you, Commissioner. That's sweet. I'm looking at you. Everybody else has talked. Would you like to say something? Uh, I agree with everything that's been said. Okay. So we're on it is the point. Yeah. We're on it. We're getting all the information we need, and we've got money to do rehab, and no, we're not going to go back and forth. I'm sorry. Um, we have rules of how we run the meeting, and so we just don't do that. But it, I think you can see that we care, and, and we're, we're on it. They're talking about it. Mayor, if I may, I want to give out my business card sure. so that we can establish some sort of line of communication so that sure. everybody understands where Because well, we yeah, don't know who don't, to get back to. So they don't, they don't need to have to come back every, every right. two weeks. Right. I mean, go ahead. Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, all right, we have the consent agenda. And on the consent agenda, we have the approval of the minutes, um, work session, regular commission meeting, workshop, and another work session. We have the board and committee appointments for Hammock, Marina, Public Relations, Youth Advisory. We have the Flanagan St. Patrick's Day celebration and the cyclical computer replacements, which, by the way, need to be pulled. Um, we'll have to address it under action items because there's a change that needs to happen to that. 
Are there any other items that need to be pulled? I would like to pull Flanagan's St. Patrick's Day celebration. Okay. Anybody else? All right, then can I have a motion to approve the minutes and the board and committee appointments? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, Commissioner Gao and Commissioner um, Franey. Mm -hmm. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to the first item, which is Flanagan's. Did you just have a question about it? Yes, it, it really was a point of clarification. I, I discussed it with uh, Jennifer that the ARPA monies also do go to um, the Flanagan's uh, St. Patrick's Day celebration, and I think Jennifer would like to comment on that, please. Yes, Mayor. Um, the question that the, the Vice Mayor uh, posed of me was whether or not Flanagan's could be reimbursed for the event through our ARPA, and the answer and is yes. It was one of the events that was on the list. But, but Waltz is too. Right. There's an agreement that, that Flanagan's answer, enters into with the city that Jason would sign and I sign off on. Is it already done? Yeah. Jory, do you want to talk a little bit about it, if you don't mind, Mayor? Hey, Jory Peterson, Special Event Coordinator. Yes, we've already completed the ARPA agreement with Jason. He has signed, Nikki has signed. We have all the signatures, and I uh, started the check request. So he should be issued a check this week. Thank you very much. I just wasn't very, real sure from my reading that that was real clear, and I had asked Jennifer to clarify. I had to read it twice, too, for the same reason. Just the way it was worded mm -hmm. kind of confused me. But so, I. So, yeah, that was my point of clarification. Any other questions from anybody? Jason, you want to come up and speak for any reason? Okay, yeah, come on. Uh, I just want to say, you know, I think we all remember two years ago when I sat in this chamber, and it was it was bad news. The day of, yeah. And, uh, I remember that, yeah. Feels Awful. pretty damn good today. <laughs> That's all. Well, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Jason. Oh, Hopefully, these ARPA funds Friday. will help you out <laughs> tremendously for the get you through the hump. Is Jason aware that we actually changed our commission meeting so we could all be partying on St. Patrick's Day? Did you really? <laughs> we did. We totally oh, did. I love how this town directs. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, we did have a commission meeting probably 10 or 12 years ago on St. Patty's Day, and I vowed to never see that happen again. <laughs> well, Ever. I can't so even imagine trying to part. <laughs> well, they're probably better for the public. Oh, I <laughs> all right. Thank you, Jason. All right, can I have a motion to approve the Flanagan's? So um, move. Okay. Second. Vice Mayor Kynes and Commissioner Franey. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. We look forward to it. All right, and then we have the cyclical commu computer replacements. Jennifer, you said there was a change to the title. Mayor, yes, there is. Um, the good news is the amount stays the same at $125,056.89. The number of, of computers, iPads, and laptops that we're buying is different, however. The, uh, the numbers in your agenda as published were for fiscal year 23. We're buying for fiscal year 2022, and so we are actually want to buy 69 lap desktop computers, 21 laptops, and nine iPads, so actually more, more uh, devices than, than for we're- For the same amount of money. For the same amount, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Any questions or concerns? No. All right. I'm willing to no. make a motion. Yeah. Go right ahead. So Vice moved. Mayor. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Commissioner Franey, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All righty. Now we'll go to the official action items. We have an amended interlocal agreement with Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority for the redeployment of the autonomous vehicle demonstration in downtown Dunedin. Jeannie Garner will be presenting for staff, Mayor. Okay. And we Jeannie have the STA with us? Yes. Yeah, good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Vice Mayor and Commission. Uh, we bring to you this morning a request to approve the interlocal agreement between the city and PSTA for the redeployment of the autonomous vehicle demonstration. Uh, we do have Jacob from PSTA, and from BEEP we have representatives for the vehicle vendor. Also, Sue Bernass will speak to the communications uh, marketing plan for the redeployment. So Jacob has a presentation that he'd like to present. So if you're ready, Jacob. Yes, I am. Wait, should I move over there or stay over here? Or? Oh, 
Fine. Yes, okay, great. Right great, good morning. It's great to be back. So I'm Jacob Labudka, Senior Planner with Pinellas Sun Coast Transit Authority. And so as Jeannie just said, um, we're uh, today recommending approval uh, for an amended interlocal agreement to bring autonomous vehicle advantage, uh, our autonomous vehicle demonstration program back to Dunedin. Of course, as I'm sure you'll recall, we did operate this demonstration program for just under six weeks last year. Um, but we did, of course, suspend service following um, the incident that happened last summer. And so since then, um, we have uh, the, our vendor Beep, who's with us. We're joined with uh, by Stephen Curry and wait, no, Bear, wait, Curry, Barry. Sorry, I don't know why I said Curry. Maybe I'm just maybe I'm just hungry for Curry. I don't know. Stephen Barry and Matt Thur with Beep, um, who's also with us to join any questions. Um, Beep has implemented enhanced safety protocols, and in addition, we have changed the vehicle that we will be using for this demonstration. So I just wanted to come here today and give you the updated details on the demonstration, and of course, allow you to uh, answer. Uh, ask any questions that you may have. So currently, um, Ava's actually out on Clearwater Beach, um, where she'll be operating until the end of this month. And then following the, once that service is complete, uh, we would like for Ava to come back to Dunedin um, as early as mid-April. So last, last year when Ava operated in, here in Dunedin, um, she carried just over 2,000 passengers in her time here, which was actually record-setting ridership on a per-weekly basis. Um, it actually, I, I knew it was gonna do well here, but it actually exceeded my expectations, and I was very pleased to see that. Um, so we think she'll have, kind of, uh, a continued success uh, with ridership along our corridor that I will show you later in the presentation. So we're currently expected to launch um, as early as mid-April, and we plan to operate for about six weeks with the shuttle shown here, the Navia shuttle. Last year when we were here, we operated a shuttle called the Ollie shuttle made by a company called Local Motors. And so now we will be switching to the Navia vehicle, which is what we used to operate in downtown St. Petersburg last year, as shown in the image here. And this is also the vehicle that is currently out on Clearwater Beach and that will be coming here following the demonstration in Clearwater. And, and so um, in the next slide I'll show um, this vehicle does have some additional safety features that the previous vehicle did not have. And to fund this demonstration, um, we have allocated funding from our capital budget to fully fund operations. So a couple of things that distinguish this vehicle from the previous vehicle that was operated. Um, so our vendor Beep is able to remotely monitor the day-to-day -day operations of the vehicle. Um, this was some, a feature that was not available with the previous vehicle, the Ali vehicle, um, just due, due to limitations of the manufacturer. But with this vehicle, there is allowed for remote operations from their command center in Orlando. And in addition, there's a feature with this vehicle called assisted manual driving. So Beep will be limiting the use of manual driving. So for, of course, since this is an autonomous vehicle demonstration program, the vehicle will be primarily operating autonomously. And for those few instances when it does have to operate manually, this AMD feature will kick in. And what essentially this does is anytime a pedestrian is within 10 feet of the vehicle, there will be a loud audible noise that is made within the vehicle. And, and so when that noise happens, the attendants are trained to immediately respond to the noise, stop the vehicle, and to not proceed until it is deemed safe to do so. So that is a new feature that was not available um, with the previous vehicle. So this is the route that we are intending to operate. So this is the same route that we started off with last year when we operated here in Dunedin. So we'll be starting here, um, starting downtown at uh, Main and Douglas at the former Ocean Optics parking lot um, with stops at Douglas and Scotland Street, and going all the way down to the library um, adjacent to TD Ballpark. Um, our anticipated service schedule would be to operate from Wednesday through Sunday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. We initially started last year with a schedule of 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., um, but we actually received requests from riders to make the service start earlier so they could go to the library since the library, I believe, opens at 9.30, and so we were able to, um, we adjusted the schedule to uh, fulfill that request for, to be able to serve the library. So the um, final service schedule you know, may vary uh, based on any local events that are happening, maybe minor league games or other community events, and we also wanna make sure that uh, this service also aligns with the library hours. And so this route is also subject to NHTSA approval. Our vendor Beep is kind of going back and forth with uh, NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, who will um, be, is the body that will grant approval for this vehicle to operate on the public roadway. So they are currently in conversations with them now seeking approve, final approval for this route. 
And so the um, interlocal agreement terms, it's pretty much the exact same agreement that we took to you uh, last year. Um, so divided into city responsibilities and PSDA responsibilities. So the primary city responsibilities are any needed improvements to route infrastructure. Um, the main thing here is just the trimming of vegetation. I remember last year, the, right, the day before that we started service, I was getting ca calls from uh, Beep saying, hey, we need a, a tree or a hedge trimmed here uh, along the route. And thankfully, city staff was very responsive in being able to make that happen. So that's the main thing with uh, route infrastructure, um, as well as um, securing rooftop space for satellite communications equipment, which we will be resuming our partnership with the artisan apartments where we put the satellite communications equipment and, in addition, also stored the vehicles. Um, any improvements to stop infrastructure, which we plan on using the same stops as last year, so the stop should be good as is. And again, um, the vehicle storage location where the vehicle will um, be sleep, well, Ava will sleep at night, as well as be able to charge and be able to be washed off weekly. But again, this will be um, at the artisan apartment homes. Uh, we're very lucky to have this uh, storage location here. This is probably one of the most difficult things when doing this sort of deployment. Uh, when, we were, uh, when we were trying to find a location for storage out on Clearwater Beach, um, so a comment I made to the city council is that as somebody that's six foot six, I can barely fit into most parking garages, let alone this vehicle that's actually nine feet tall from floor to sensor. But thankfully, um, we've had, been able to have a great partnership with the Artisan Apartment Homes. That is a great facility for that. And the PSTA responsibilities, again, same as last year, we will be funding, deploying, and maintaining uh, the project, developing, installing any temporary signage that needs to go up. This is typically A-frames, uh, the temporary A-frames that go up at all stop locations, and providing emergency response training um, for fire and rescue. And so I think, um, do we, do, Sue, do you want to come up and say anything before we take questions, or? Sure. Okay, great. Good morning, Mayor. Vice Mayor and Commission Members, Sue Burness, Director of Communications for the City of Dunedin. Uh, so we are going to be working closely with PSTA and BEEP um, as we um, launch AVA back into the community and um, making sure, obviously, safety, confidence, all of that at the forefront. Um, and so we have a meeting actually later this week in which we'll talk about our communication strategies. We'll be working with all of our partners to get information out. And I think one of the important messages that we really want to convey is that AVA is a, uh, is a transportation option, especially for those who want to come downtown and maybe want to park at the library or at the health center and uh, be transported by AVA downtown and then can walk and explore downtown and not have to worry about finding another parking place downtown. So um, obviously those are all key messages, transportation, convenience, but we will be keeping an eye on safety and uh, also trying to make sure that people feel confident in this new mode of transportation. And we will be working um, with the PSTA team and BEEP um, in alignment so that we can all be on the same page. Great, thank you, Sue. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, or if you have any questions for the vendor, happy to answer any questions you may have. Can you respond real quick, Sue? I mean, I know that everybody's probably gonna wanna ask this question, so I'm just doing it on behalf of all of us. We're going to get questioned all over the place about what happened with the last situation and why should we trust being on this again. I mean, that's essentially what people are going to say. It's, as soon as people hear about this right now or as soon as they hear the launch, that's going to be the thing all over social media. So how do we address that? Right. Well, we will work with the partners. Um, we've already had those conversations a year ago, last summer, last fall, um, in, in anticipation of Ava coming back. So, you know, we need to have transparency, but also, you know, let them know that there's been a lot of new um, improvements to the vehicle. From what we understand, there's new sensors. I mean, this is a newly re, uh, redesigned vehicle. Is that correct, Jake? Yes, this is a totally different vehicle than the vehicle uh, that operated last year. And the incident that happened last year um, happened while the vehicle was in manual mode. And so, yeah, so, yeah, so it was not, did not happen in autonomous mode. Right, right. And we think part of that was also that 
the, the route and the complications of that curve. There were a couple of incidents that week, but we want to make sure people know that all of these additional safety improvements have been made to this vehicle or what this vehicle looks like. And again, we're going to rely on, on, on some of those uh, key technical aspects um, and, and to, to provide English to the community um, in, in how that will uh, translate into a safe experience, a safe, fun, and convenient experience. And we'll also stress, Mayor, that this particular vehicle has been running in Clearwater and St. Petersburg safely for, for a period of time, much longer than the Ollie was here. Correct. And no incidents. And Correct. no incidents. With no incidents. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions for you, Vice Mayor? Anything? Uh, Questions? I think I just asked it. I wanted okay. to know had there been any, any incidents. Um, I, I, I'm very interested in the, there's a control center, and then for somehow this control center can see if there's any obstacles or something that the uh, AVA is not catching, and, and then it emits a sound, it emits a sound, sort of like a train, that immediately calls for um, manual operation for someone to step in. Is that correct? Actually, you know, I'm actually going to invite our friends at Beep to uh, provide some more information. Good, good morning. Um, my name is Matt Thur. I'm the uh, EVP of service delivery at Beep. I am uh, my hire and bringing on Steve Berry, who's our chief safety officer, were, were some of the many uh, improvements Beep took. Uh, to improve our, uh, our overall operations and, and our safety um, uh, safety posture. Um, what you're referring to is what's known as AMD. Uh, there is a suite of sensors, uh, additional sensors on these Navia vehicles, uh, which when it detects a, um, uh, an object when in autonomous mode, uh, which automatically alerts the driver and and uh, issues an audible alert so that the uh, driver is uh, trained to immediately stop the shuttle at that point. Uh, in addition, we have taken um, a lot of uh, uh, efforts, training, policy, technological, uh, to improve our autonomous, uh, our, what we refer to as our autonomous efficiency, the amount of time we spend in autonomous mode. Um, the incidents, uh, the incident that occurred, occurred in manual mode. Um, so, for instance, one of the things we do is if a shuttle, any shuttle in our fleet anywhere, runs in manual mode for more than 20 seconds, uh, alerts start to show up inside of our command center uh, so that we can uh, immediately contact the, uh, the attendant uh, and understand what's going on uh, and, and possibly, you know, stop the vehicle, get it shut down and understand what's going on. Uh, we also have put in speed governors, which slow the ability of the shuttle to run in, in manual mode. Um, so that it, it operates at an even slower rate than it, than it normally would so that uh, to increase our safety. That's, that's one of dozens of, of improvements we've made from a safety perspective. And there was a line of sight issue. It is uh, not a line of sight issue. Well, no. I thought that there was some barrier to seeing at a certain. So we've also, so that was an OLLI 1.0 shuttle. Um, Beep, by the way, voluntarily took all of our OLLI 1.0 shuttles off the road after the incident. We will not put them back on. Um, there is another generation of Ollie where we've installed a set of an additional set of, can of cameras and monitors to address blind spot issues. The Navia vehicle, uh, which is running in Clearwater, uh, has also been running in Lake Nona, Port St. Lucie, uh, Peachtree Corners, Georgia, and Peoria, Arizona, uh, without any incidents whatsoever, have a, a much better uh, line of sight. Yeah, so I mean, it, it may be not engineer, that's probably not the right engineering term, but I think that, that, that they thought that there was a little blockage. Or? There was what's known as the A pillar was, was blocking, blocking line of sight in the Ali 1.0s. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have questions for, for these gentlemen? I, I can ask a real quick one. Mm -hmm. uh, how fast are these vehicles going to be going and obviously they're throttled down with a concept for them to go faster at some point in time. The, the, maximum, the maximum speed these shuttles can run at this point in time is 12 miles per hour. Um, so uh, a, a good bicycle uh, can, can pass us by. Um, and then we can throttle the governor down. Now, 
Uh, I don't know, unfortunately, the particulars of the route. There's a lot of factors that go in. A very narrow lane causes it to run, to run, to run slower. Uh, or if there's uh, significant vegetation or bollards or something on the road, the, the shuttle will automatically slow down. But 12 miles per hour is the maximum that we run at. But at some point in time, it would seem like you would want to be throttling that. App, the, the goal it, would be yes. There. So most likely by 2024, we'll be deploying a new set of shuttles, which can go as fast as 35 miles per hour. These particular shuttles and the use cases we're looking at are slow fixed route um, uh, situations, and is where these are test programs, learning how they operate, and uh, so that we can operate at faster speeds safely. But that's probably a good year, year and a half out. I'll be asking another question of that gentleman right behind you that relates to this. Okay. So, thanks. thank you, guys. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, and you can ask your question. Top of the day. Good to see you. Um, you recall when I, I was, I'm going to give you the background really quick so everybody hears and maybe figures out where I'm going with this. So uh, when I was on the board at the PSTA, and, and you know that I was really, really excited about this project for Dunedin immediately volunteering, Dunedin saying we're a square, you know, boom, operate within this area. And well, there were two goals uh, for me at that point in time. One was a simple transportation goal. In other words, if we had an operator in this vehicle, this vehicle could be doing a crisscrossing, as a matter of fact, actually picking up folks to get them to the bus line if they needed to get to the bus line, because we had just a couple of buses going through here, but then also because of a parking issue that we had in Dunedin at that time. So I was looking, I was interested in both stepping from the autonomous to the manual operated uh, back and forth, but particularly starting off in, in the manual and then going, going to the autonomous. So that, that being said, um, and you may recall some of that, in fact, when I went up to Tallahassee, I spoke, we had a senator that was really into transportation, and I was talking about that. When, when do we do that, and when can we do That's really the electrifying the transportation uh, within a local community, and thanks for remembering all of that. So. It seems to me like now we really are focusing on the autonomous side of this rather than the f other side of it, the, the, the connect connectivity within, within the different transportation modes. Um, and we're learning, we're spending more time on learning how to make it autonomous than what we are um, manual operated. Is that, that's the focus currently. And then the qu I have two questions and those gentlemen behind you can help with us just a little bit. How many communities in the world, but specifically in the United States, have autonomous vehicles functioning today, and 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 how are they functioning? Are they are they functioning only autonomously, or are they functioning in, in the manual mode as well? And are they are they doing the actual crisscrossing within throughout a community? Well, Big question, but I want everybody to see. Well, first off, great to see you again, too. Your excitement is def definitely still palatable from your time on the PSTA board, and definitely appreciate that. So let's see. In terms of the types of vehicle that are, will be operating here, I couldn't give you an exact number, but there's definitely um, dozens of deployments and probably maybe hundreds throughout the world, but at least dozens within the continental U.S. Um, for these particular types of vehicles, um, the, t the type of service that we're operating here is uh, would be very similar to in other locations. So I know one of the limits one of the limitations is that um, typically for this sort of vehicle, um, the route would be maybe no more than three miles round trip. So you see a lot of the sorts of services that are maybe from you know first last mile connecting to other modes, or you sometimes have um, community circulators. Um, you see a lot of college campuses that also deploy these types of vehicles. Um, so and in addition to the low speed shuttles, so I think part of our interest in this is being able to, and focusing on the autonomous nature of this is um, really as the Public Transit Authority learning what autonomous vehicle operations look like for these small, smaller, lower speed shuttles because I think in the future we're going to be maybe looking more towards what this technology might look like on a fixed route 35, 40 foot bus. And you see other places, not so much in the U.S., although that it is coming 
probably in the next couple of years. But in other places in the world, um, Singapore, China, they're already deploying um, fully autonomous fixed route buses. And so I think at, as we do a demonstration program like this, something, uh, something that we're going to be doing here in Dunedin um, is a community sentiment survey on board to um, ascertain how uh, riders feel about the technology, how this particular demonstration um, it impacted their view of the technology. And because we really want to make sure this uh, this is a, a good community outreach effort for us to um, ascertain how the community feels about it and make sure that the community is comfortable as we proceed to sort of that next step of being able to have it maybe be a fully functioning permanent part of the transportation system that be able to be permanently, you know, connect to all modes of transportation. So on the first part of it, less than autonomous, um, I know I went to disability and, and also we talked to the elderly and, and uh, uh, committee that we have here. And they were very interested in getting people to be able to be transported and having the problems. And PSTA has a system for that. So we, we brought PSTA and they presented certainly to the, to the elderly committee about how we were current, how PSTA is currently doing that. But that was the interest in having this vehicle. We have so many people that could make access to a vehicle like this. Um, it, are you finding that, are you finding that uh, request or, or ask in, in other communities? Not only, I'm asking for just Pinellas, yeah. but then how about, how about in the state of Florida or other community or the world? I mean, are other people looking for that kind of thing? Hmm. No, that is a, that is a great question. Um, hmm, I'll think about that. I think. Let's see. Well, do you have uh, examples of use cases and other? Because I knew they probably be more familiar so, with that than I would be. You'll have to come up to the microphone, oh, please. Sorry. I apologize. Uh, that's precisely what we're doing in Peoria, Arizona. Uh, the shuttles there are deployed in a, uh, uh, a community that's connecting a lot of uh, senior citizen housing to about 100 different medical offices uh, to provide uh, ADA compliant transportation services. Um, to, to, to enable the, the transportation for people to, to, to get to the services that they need. Because I know we had a concern, not only, not only health, but folks being able to get out to get necessary things like food um, and, or, and or just to get out to see somebody, to get to the Hale Center or something like that here for us. Hale Center is a, a center where, they, where, where we do a lot of functions, et cetera. But so that was the concern of that. And of course, we do have a we do have a community here that, that is uh, seasoned, and we also have a younger community side here. Um, but that was one of the interests of, of, of doing that as we bled into the autonomous side, realizing the autonomous side was not fully developed then, it still is not, with, with some questions and issues in it. But I was just curious to see how many people were using this concept as they were, as they were moving it up into higher speeds in, in the autonomous side to accomplish that task, which which we like to be avant-garde. We, we like to be leaders and things. So we always said, let us be leaders. Well, we like to be leaders. Try it. I do want to be clear, that is still a fixed route, slow speed shuttle that's doing that service out there right now. Um, but it's, it's you know, one step at a time with, with this kind of uh, uh, new technology, including the ability to go to a on-demand fixed route where you can request a shuttle at a particular point in time so that you can come out and get it and get transported within the fixed route framework. Within the fixed Within route. the fixed route, as opposed to the anywhere to anywhere kind of model, which is is a much more complex engineering. Is that being run autonomous now, then? The, yes, it's in, uh, let's say we're in a, in, a, in a very small beta of that ability to do on demand so we're not quite ready to push that out there, but it is something we're well aware what of and working on. What is the speed on. of that? I'm asking because of that one is still. Those are all still limited by the vehicle itself. The faster vehicle we are looking to have available by the end of 2023. Um, it's still the. Still. And you know why I'm asking so that people that are listening, or if in case they're wondering, we have streets that we have streets and roads. We have streets that are 25, and then we go to, and you go to county, and then we go to state, and different speed limits, different requirements. So. Are they able to deal with all of that? In, in so we are right now, um, given the, the these vehicles required these NHTSA special waivers, we have to get an approval for every route. NHTSA will not let us run them on a road that is faster than 25 miles an hour right now, and that is that is a federal government regulation. Uh, that will be lifting 
uh, with the newer generation vehicles, um, which will have uh, a slightly different construction and meet what's known as FMVSS. I don't want to get into it. Like, so that's super like technical. 23. Yes. Uh, maybe. Maybe all the way. You don't have to wait that long. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner, any questions? No, I don't have anything. Been Commissioner, Jeff, you have any questions? Uh, Jacob, you know, are uh, exceeding expectations of 2,000 riders, is that still a record? Yes, that is uh, still, well, at least on a um, per week basis for Pinellas County deployments, you have the highest weekly ridership. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, just come back to a couple of questions I have. Um, Good question. Good question. Nikki, hey, I'm sure you've uh, reviewed the contract. Mm -hmm. um, given, I mean, I know you look for this stuff all the time anyway, but, you know, given the last time we went through this, and, of course, we didn't have any liability, but doesn't stop people from suing, you feel confident that we're protected with this agreement from liability? The same, the same indemnification and protections flow mm -hmm. through to both PSTA and the city in this agreement. And I, I'm actually glad that you asked the question, Mayor, because since BEEP is here, I just want to say when that incident occurred, they immediately stepped up. PSTA and the city were never embroiled in that dispute. And I just want to thank them for being good partners in their contract and you know, really following through. There was no question or dispute as between the partners to the contract, and we really appreciate BEEP for following, following through with that. Thank you. Um, the start date, you're talking about mid-April? Yes. Okay. So, as you know, spring training has been fluctuating. Um, you're ending, what, March 30th or whatever for Clearwater Beach? Yes. I... I understand why you might want a, a little break or something, but I, not knowing what's happening with spring training, but thinking that they may still have one, given the current things we're hearing in the news, it would be really important to try to start at the very beginning of April. I do know our intention is, as soon as we're done in Clearwater Beach, is to immediately come to Dunedin and start as soon as possible, and as we can in April. So I can follow back, circle back with the BEEP team, and see if there's any way we can um, reduce some of the slack in our schedule to start as early as possible in the month. Well, and I do. Didn't we have Ava during some games last year? Was it regular season or whatever? We yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah, yes. wasn't it? So I mean, my point is, is I understand the best time to test Clearwater Beach is during spring break. The best time to test in Dunedin is during spring training. So, I mean, we want to be smart about how we roll these things out. And a lot of people are going home in mid-April. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to bring that forward. And, you know, so if we can get out there April 1st, I think we would be better served. I really do. Unfortunately, All the way around to get a better test. Unfortunately, I do believe that... Um, and Correct me if I'm wrong, folks. I think we need a minimum of two weeks between deployments to move the vehicles. There's some pre-route testing that has to happen, um, but we'll definitely work with the team to start. So is that not can. something you can do while that's running out there? Un you have to have the vehicle. Un yeah, unfortunately, we will need both vehicles to do the operations in Colorado Beach, and so we would immediately transport them um, April 1st to here to Dunedin. Okay. Well, I mean, I understand all that. I Yeah. The mayor in Clearwater would hate me for saying this, but if you want to duck out of clear water a week earlier. Oh, my God. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, we're going to start a war. Well, I mean, if we're going to, you know, effort, there's going to be a lot of effort in marketing. and There's going to be a lot of effort into this on all sides, okay? And so, again, when we test something, I want us to put our best foot forward. And during spring training, which I said last year, same thing, during spring training is the best time to do it. Um, so you oh. all will work towards those things with this organization. Um, and then finally, Sue, I, I heard you say, because it's interesting, I, I hadn't looked at it this way. You had said that it was good to have people, if they wanted to park at the Hale Center or the library and come into the downtown. I kept thinking of people going that way. Um, are we going to promote that? Absolutely. So that's an interesting way to look at this. Really, because you're you're removing some of the congestion from downtown and putting it in other places. Obviously, I don't need to tell you we have to 
coordinate all that with you know whatever's going on at the library and the Hale Center, but absolutely. And it's Wednesday through Saturday or Wednesday through Sunday? Uh, Wednesday through Sunday, although, of course, we'll um, work with the city and make sure that that schedule is in alignment with any local events, library hours, and yeah. whatnot. Oh, I will say an additional comment um, for on regards to the ridership. Even without spring training last year, so there was about a week or two where we had to cut the service by half while we prepped the Main Street route. And so I believe it was the fourth week. Um, so instead of operating 12 hours a day, we only operated six hours per day. And for that week, we had 210 riders. So for a basically half of the amount of service time, uh, the ridership that it was experienced during that week was similar to some of the weeks we had in St. Petersburg that had double the amount of service per day. So even without baseball, there was still ridership along the route that actually was a lot more than I expected. Except that we were in a pandemic. Yeah. And we didn't have as many visitors. And except that now, what we didn't have then were the Canadian travelers here. Okay. And we still, I mean, we're getting them now and they're going to spring train. They, they're hoping you know, a lot of them own homes here. So it's a completely different environment this year than it was last year. So, I, again, I just want to point it out. I know you all have to work through the humps, but I'm just giving you feedback on what, you know. And, by the way, it's not – for you guys, for everyone, it's a test, It's testing the autonomous piece of this whole thing, right? For us, it's moving around people and getting them in the right parking places so that we manage and have – better parking situation. So there's a benefit to us, not just the yeah. autonomous. So we get the biggest benefit if you do that during spring training. That's my point. Yeah. Oh, no, of course. We definitely want this to be a symbiotic relationship. But sure. we'll work closely with our um, friends in the marketing department here at the city to make sure that we deploy this in such a way that we can maximize ridership and complement your goals to increase sure. mobility in the city. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and then you are, as a part of this, we're looking to reduce the speed on Douglas, right? Correct. Right. We need to go from and again, to that during spring training makes a lot of sense because there's just a lot of cars on Douglas anyway. Okay, but past that, it doesn't. So, again, I'm just throwing that out there. All right, so what we need now, um, anybody from the public wish to come forward and speak? All right, so what we need now then is a motion to do the redeployment, ag approve the agreement, and approve the temporary speed reduction. Is that all one thing? Yes, ma'am? Correct. Yes? Okay, so can I have a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Commissioner Gow and Commissioner Twonga. <laughs> well, I heard him too. It's so I, fine. Okay. It's absolutely fine. All right. Any final comments from anybody? No. I just want to acknowledge that Dunedin must be a handful or just a few, if not the only one, that would actually have enough library patrons to change the schedule of this demo. That, that just speaks volumes to, for our library and the activities there. So kudos and a tip of the hat. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I just want to say I'm excited about it. I think, again, I, I think Dunedin is they lead. And, um, and thanks to Joe Kay for offering up his uh, his uh, parking area. And um, but I'm excited. I think again, this is the future. We know we have, you know, we have problems moving people around and parking and everything. And this is a great way to stay in the game and be proactive about what the future is going to hold for us. So I'm I'm excited about it. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. You know, the only thing I wish is that when you keep doing this. If only it could fly, like the Jetsons, <laughs> like if the only. Jetsons, you know? If only. It's a matter of time. <laughs> if only pigs could fly. I just, you know. You know if only Ava could fly. <laughs> Ava. But it does sound awful to say. I mean, obviously the accident was bad that it happened, but the fact that it was in manual says something about the future of autonom autonomous vehicles yeah. because it was manual. So, um, yeah. anyway. Commissioner. Thank you. So. Um, I appreciate what's been going on. It's been taking a long time for us to move this along, and so I'm anxious, very, very anxious, and I know we're still at, a, at this little girl here, Ava, um, attempting to get rolling, um, I, and I didn't hear exactly what the results have been so far at, at Clearwater, but I would assume it's been acceptable. So, again, I'm, I'm, I'm more avant-garde and, and to get some of this stuff uh, stuff happening. But obviously, 
you are watching the rest of the world and to see what they're doing. I think Singapore is a wonderful place to watch because they're so so far ahead of ahead of everything on, on almost everything now in transportation and and, and living and, and, and the like. So um, I am very interested in this from the standpoint of residents within Dunedin not having to use a car at some point in time to come to our downtown or go to do basic things. So I'm all for the, in fact, the mayor was saying, let's get, to, let's get this thing going as fast as we can. I think we all feel that way, as fast as we can, as fast as we can, get it rolling. We couldn't agree more. Get it doing and, and then get it implemented. Thank you, thanks for the presentation, appreciate it. Okay, thank you guys, appreciate you coming out. Um, we're gonna, uh, is, let me get an all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. You guys have heard our feedback and what we're trying to achieve. So thank you very much. Thank you. I can now officially plan my Dunedin staycation. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, Deb, do we want to take a little five-minute break so you can get up and walk around a little bit? Uh, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm really okay. You okay. Thank you. All right. We'll, we'll do one more item, and then we'll take a break. Um, now we'll move on to the FCT grant agreement for the Gladys Douglas Preserve. Okay, um, any opening, Jennifer? Uh, none, Mayor, hand it straight over to Vince. Okay, Vince, welcome. Good morning again, Vince Gizzi, Parks and Recreation Director. And with me I have Lainey Sheets, who is the Recreation uh, Administrative Superintendent. Uh, and she's gonna be speaking today regarding the grant administration and the management plan requirements. Also, Nikki Day, our City Attorney, will be providing her comments on the FC grant, FCT grant as well. Uh, also with us today is Craig Wilson, City Arborist, and Bruce Worth, Senior Engineer, are both here this morning. They will be assisting me with uh, the design. They will be assisting the project with the design and development and are here to answer any questions if needed. And at the end of all that, uh, the city manager asked, asked me if I would just do a quick narrative of um, what we've done so far in the property, uh, what we're doing now, and what the future plans are to get, complete the project. So I'll do that at the end of the presentation. With okay, that. For now, we'll just talk about the agreement and then we'll get into those other things. Yes. Okay. On October 20th, 2020, the City Commission provided direction and approval for staff to pursue the acquisition of the Gladys E. Douglas Preserve and to work in partnership with Pinellas County, Pinellas County to submit a grant application to the Florida Community Trust better known as FCT. On December 15th, 2020, the city and Pinellas County submitted a joint grant application to the state of Florida Department of Environmental Protection. On November 29th, 2021, the Florida Community Trust notified applicants the priority list had been approved and the Gladys E. Douglas Preserve application had been formally selected for funding. And on February 4th, 2022, the City of Dunedin and Pinellas County received the FCT grant agreement. This grant will provide 40% of the eligible costs for the appraised value of the property and acquisition costs not to exceed $2.4 million. Our existing interlocal agreement with Pinellas County outlines the respective responsibilities of each party as it relates to park development and maintenance activities. The county would receive the first 1.5 million based on their acquisition contribution of 3.5 million, and the city would receive the remaining balance. The Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners will also be voting today to approve the FCT grant agreement. I believe that meeting's this afternoon, county. The FCT grant stipulates the park amenities shall be constructed and facilities shall be open to the public within three years of receiving the funds. The agreement will begin upon execution of both parties, city and state, and the FCT agrees to make funding available for one year after the date of execution, unless extended or terminated earlier. So with that, I'm just gonna ask Laney to briefly review some of the grant administration that needs to take place uh, through this process and also um, give us the information about what's included in the management plan, what's required. So with that, Laney. Good morning. 
so as you know, we've um, had two recent projects that you all are very familiar with that we've gone through this, this same process with. Uh, the first was the Weaver property uh, that we went through this exact same procedure and then also the extension to the Hammock Park with the Our Lady of Lord purchase. Uh, so I was here for both of those administrations. I've gone through this process twice before, so this is nothing new uh, to our department. We're fully vetted in the different um, idiosyncrasies and procedures that the uh, Department of uh, Environmental Protection has with this program. Uh, after the execution of the agreement, uh, the next phase that we go into is the development of the management plan. And that outlines a number of different things of outlining the different communities, uh, environmental communities that are out at the site, how we're going to manage those, as well as the different site amenities that will be on site, even though those are articulated in the agreement and in the application. It just kind of gets codified, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, through that management plan. Uh, it also outlines the different educational programs. There's a number of different things. It, that is a very significant document that gets put together. Uh, generally, it's over 100 pages. So that takes quite a few months uh, for us to develop, put together, submit to them. Uh, fingers crossed, um, we've gotten better with it. The first time I did this, uh, we did this with the uh, Weaver Park. It went back and forth a few times to get it into the format that they wanted. Uh, the one with Hammock Park, uh, there were just a couple of minor changes once we submitted that. Uh, once they approve the management plan, we get into a project plan phase. And this is more of the due diligence reports uh, and that they want in a very particular format and a report uh, from, and it's documents mostly that we already have uh, from the purchase agreements and such, um, and different maps that they want. Um, there's they actually then codify the agreement back in these other documents. Uh, so that gets submitted um, to them. Once that project plan is approved, then we submit for reimbursement. So uh, it takes anywhere between 8 and 12 months uh, for the entire process of these next few phases uh, before uh, the city receives the actual funding uh, from, the, from the time that we execute the agreement to the, the time that we receive a check in the mail. Uh, so that's why you see in the agreement they say funding for 12 months unless we need to extend because that's generally about the time frame that it takes uh, for these types of projects. Once we receive the funds, then as Vince articulated, it takes, um, they give us in general um, up to three years to develop the project site um, and all the different amenities that and um, accesses that we have committed to uh, both the city and the county in the agreement and in the application. Uh, there are some exceptions that uh, may happen to that. It basically, when we submit the management plan, we also give them a timeline that each of the different components are going to take uh, to develop. And sometimes that does extend beyond the three-year. And once they basically agree to the management plan, they're agreeing to that timeline. Um, and we do then uh, go into an annual reporting with the state. Uh, once we receive the funds, uh, we are then going into what is called stewardship reports and revenue reports. So we get into a, an annual reporting back to them as to the progress of the project and how it's coming along, whether we're sticking to the time frame, whether we may need to make any changes to our management plan. Uh, we submit those. Once all is finally said and done, uh, everything is built, everything's open, the project is, for all intents, completed, we then still report back to the state through an annual report, and eventually they, we can apply to get on a five-year cycle. So right now, uh, just for your reference, the Weaver Park, uh, once that was completed, we had a number of maybe five years that we were doing annual reporting. We are now down to every five-year reporting for Weaver, um, um, and I coordinate that. And then the, um, well, the revenue is done annually, but the, the stewardship report is done every five years. Uh, we uh, Hammock, we are still on an annual reporting. So. Go ahead. I'll turn it back to Vince. Nikki. 
Oh, so um, as Vince mentioned that we had been sent the FCT grant agreement that's before you today for review and approval. And these agreements are largely standard. As you can imagine, the trust has a format and a document that they use, but we were able to successfully get a few items that were important to the county and the city um, worked into the agreement. The two most um, significant were the ability to cure any default because you all have other community partners and the appraised value um, was far lower than what the community value was in this instance. We want to make sure that there's those clear opportunities for any minor, if the, the city has never been in default on any of its fi other grant agreements, so that, but that's not how I review an agreement. I always review it for the worst case scenario to make sure the city's protected and, and in this case that the community contributions mm -hmm. were protected. And then the second aspect is there are a number of obligations you may see um, that are reflective of representations that the county and the city made for future plans surrounding the um, waterfront portions of the property. And because that would all be still subject to survey and everything, we wanted to make sure that it was clear that there were no obligations being put on the city or the county for land that it did not yet own. <laughs> Um, I know that there are there has been discussions about acquiring um, the rights to use Jerry Lake or the title to the property <coughs> itself, but because we're signing the, ex, the the agreement as of today, when neither the county nor the city have those rights, we wanted to be sure it was clear that all of those obligations are subject to those other things occurring. Those two agreement, those two changes were uh, or two substantive areas of change were accepted by the FCT, accepted by the county, and everyone has approved the form of the agreement that is before you today. So you're telling us don't touch it? <laughs> well, I'm just, no, I'm it was happy a joke. to answer any questions. It was a joke. Have. But yes, I, I'm saying if we have any further changes, it may be complicated to get worked in, but I think we have caught all of the ones. And, and this is a guess was kind of unique. I know Laney and Vince turned to me, they said, Nikki, they're not gonna change this agreement. And I said, well, I think if we just ask the question, they might, and they did. So good kudos to our partners at the state, too, for being willing to work with the county and the city on this monumental project. Okay. It was, you a, wanna... it was a one day turnaround. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Working with the Great. state. And the county. And we were already on everybody's agenda. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead not. and. You want me just wrapping up the. Yes. Uh, okay. I mean, well, I mean, talk I... about all the stuff you wanted to talk about. Look, before we start talking or we'll get off the beaten path. Because I was going to go everything. through okay. our project list. Yes. Would you like me to do that now? Yeah. yeah. Everything you were going to do, I'd like you to do it now. Well, the first thing I want to do is just show a two-minute video. Okay. A, a little bit about the, um, right. the park and tells a little bit where it's at, uh, and then I'll go into a little more detail. Okay. So just We have some history and updates of the Gladys Douglas Preserve. This untouched, undeveloped parcel of land could have been lost to a private developer. And this community, they knew this was a beautiful piece of property and they wanted to keep it forever. Between 1,100 private donations, this community, and this is like an unbelievable number, raised $4.5 million. Starting beginning to mid-March, our Parks Division of Parks and Recreation will be out stabilizing the trails on the west side of the property, and they'll be putting down crushed uh, concrete or shell that'll help stabilize the trails. That process will probably take about four to six months. Uh, we're also looking to expand the entrance so that cars can get in and out. Right now, it's just a one-lane road. Once that's done, parks and uh, engineering are working on a plan to develop a temporary parking lot so we can start using those trails on the west side of the property. One of the projects that we've already completed was to fence in the conservation area, but it's through what we call a field fence, where animals can run through still and they could jump over, but it'll protect the conservation area and some of the real important native planting that's in this preserve. Some of the future projects is an observation deck that you can actually look out into the conservation area. Also a picnic pavilion, kayak and canoe launch for, for the lake. There'll also be restrooms, there'll be security lighting, there'll be a sidewalk connecting the community to the park. We're encouraging people to walk and take their bicycles. I want to thank all of our partners, the community, for all the work they put in. This preserve is going to be just an unbelievable place for people to want to visit, and it's going to be here for forever. Nice. Nice job.
We should clap for that. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Thank you. So as I mentioned, the city manager did ask me if I could do a, a narrative on what's been completed, what we're working on, and what's going to happen next. So the projects that are completed was, as you saw in the video, we did install through the county, uh, install the conservation field fencing along the trails, and that'll protect the sensitive plant material, as well as the rosemary scrub and the rosemary bald. And, um, uh, again, when this field fence was installed, Craig Wilson, our city arborist, was out there every day making sure it was being done correctly. Uh, we also signed an agreement with the Florida Native Plant Society for a year-long floristic plant study, uh, which has been funded separately by a grant. Uh, prog project, projects in process is that floristic study going on now. Um, we're also in the process of, and these are projects in the process or beginning shortly removing old storage sheds and lean-tos uh, and structures from the site, removing undesirable items and debris, old pipe equipment. Uh, purchase order has been issued to remove and relocate electric from the lean-tos. Relocating water lines. Uh, Bruce Worth, as I mentioned, is here today, this morning, uh, senior engineer. He's completed the entryway design off Virginia Avenue and has worked with the county on getting a permit for that. So. Great job, Bruce. Thank you for that. Um, Parks is, as we speak, uh, presently today, we widening the access road off Virginia. You saw the road uh, that I mentioned that was coming in off Virginia, one lane. Uh, we're opening that up to two lane, cleaning up the, the both sides of the, uh, of the existing road to, to widen that so we can have cars going in and out. Uh, we're relocating the front gate. We'll be moving it, eventually moving it back. Um, installing a temporary parking area. Uh, Parks is also using uh, crushed, crushed concrete to, um, to install in this uh, parking area. We feel we can get about 25 or 30 cars in the park in this temporary area um, and developing on stabling, stabilizing all the trails um, along the conservation area. Some of the future projects, um, first by the county, uh, they'll be responsible for vegetation and exotic removal. Um, then they'll also be responsible for vegetation enhancements, uh, converting the existing recreation building into a nature center slash museum, um, adding sidewalk connectivity to adjacent neighborhood. Again, this is, uh, and that, that was as mentioned for walking and bicycling. Uh, again, that's, that's on the county. Uh, future projects for the city, uh, in, installation of um, Picnic shelters, two, we're, we're, we're going to install two picnic shelters. Uh, park amenities will include benches, um, signage, and interpretive ki kiosks, uh, observation uh, deck or, or platform, so you can look into that conservation area, fishing pier, kayak launch, restrooms, asphalt driveway in and parking lot, and security lights. We feel that um, on the timeline that we could um, have the, the trails that I mentioned on the west side of the property completed within, in the parking area within four to six months. Uh, and again, that's going to be temporary parking, but these will be uh, the per permanent trails. Um, also, before we can commit to a timeline, um, I do really need to have, and I know that's, that's a, a concern of everybody, what, what the timing of this is, they need to have some further discussion with our city manager regarding the resources, the funds, the priority, priorities, and also the county's involvement as well. I and mean, we have to continue to work together with the county to make this a successful project. Um, so that is um, my presentation. I guess the final statement is, or is the recommendation. City staff hereby recommends the city commission approval of the SCT grant with the state of Florida Department of Environmental Protection for the Gladys C. Douglas preserve. Jennifer, did you want to talk about your thing that you want to bring forward as well? I did, Mayor. And then we'll Thank just you. it all out on the table. Yeah. yeah. Everything on the table today. The, uh, so that the video was from your city at work, which was on all our social media and, and well done. I know Sue just came back in. Kudos. It's, it's a wonderful video. We've had lots of really good compliments. Very good. On that video. The, um, and you know, what, what really struck me when you watched the video is Jerry Lake. Yeah. You know, right in the middle of all this. Right. It's, it's just astounding the water body. Um, 
we were hoping, uh, first of all, it's owned by Swift Mud, as you know, Southwest Florida Water Management District. We were hoping that um, uh, we could uh, realize as a donor through, through the Pinellas Community Foundation, it's $495,000, I believe, was what it appraised. And Swift Mud is very interested in having us purchase it. They wouldn't uh, donate it to us, unfortunately, because their policy is not to donate property. They feel that they have their, their own constituents that they have to satisfy and their, and their bond covenants and so on and so forth. And so um, uh, absent a donor coming up, I think that, we, that we've been lucky enough, if you will, as far as donors from the Pinellas Community Foundation, um, the Swift Mud would, uh, without a, uh, somebody to purchase that property, surplus that property, and then just about anybody could. And I'm, I'm, you know, I, I hesitate to put that on the record, but I think it's important that you all know that. Uh, as a result, I'm going to ask all of you to, to give staff consensus direction to move forward with purchase of Jerry Lake. It's about 55 acres of, uh, of water and the surrounding area. The, um, we would take the funds out of the Parkland Impact Fee Fund. We have $588,000 in that fund. The, um, as you know, when the City Commission uh, amended the code to switch from uh, LDO to Impact Fee, uh, and Commissioner Franey was very, was very adamant about this, 20% 20, 20 were to be used for park improvements or development of park, and the rest was for acquisition. So 20% of 588 is about $117,000. So we would be using th these funds as originally envisioned to acquire the property, to acquire park property. So at the end of the day, if we're successful in this venture, we will have uh, uh, assembled, 100 acres. assembled 100 awesome. acres of pressing open space for $2 million. So we're asking that you allow us to move forward. Shout out to John Hubbard and yep. LDO again. Okay, uh, so we've got all kinds of things we can be asking questions for. Why don't we start, just to try to keep this organized and not jump all over the place, why don't we talk about the agreement itself, the grant agreement? Are there any questions or comments on the grant agreement piece? You know, I don't know where this question falls, but I'm just curious, the 2.4 million, how, like, the county's totally doing their money offset the purchase price so any improvements are our, 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 our money? They're also doing improvements with their money. Okay, they are, like yeah, in that, the that's preserved the area. center renovation, the exotic removal, they put up the field fence, okay. the enhancements okay, of just, exotics. I, that wasn't clear, I was so just trying They to are clear. doing their, their portion. Okay, so does all their money go to improvements or, or just some of it? Well, it's up to them. So the, technically the FCT is for acquisition. acquisition. So this is to reimburse for acquisition. Okay. We are then going to turn around. We have the interlocal agreement with the county that that stipulates how much of the 2.4. And it, it's up to 2.4. It will likely not be 2.4. It'll probably be closer to the 2.2. It is because of, but we always ask for more because you can never, you can never ask for more if your numbers come up less. Right. Um, so of the 2.2, though, or to 2.4, somewhere in that range, the first 1.5 goes to Pinellas County. The remainder comes to the city of Dunedin. We will then turn around and use those monies towards development, but the purpose of it is to reimburse the city for the $2 million that we fronted for the purchase. Yeah, and that's why I was just trying to understand what the, what the county was doing as far as their improvements. Um, yeah. So their improvements will all be on the... Yeah. Sanctuary the side nature or whatever. The, the na yeah. nature the side. Right. Na yeah. Yeah. yeah, conservation. They've actually yeah. already done some of their improvements, removing nuisance species They've and, done and that, fencing right? the ca conservation area, the 18 the acres. And then What's the nuisance species? Brazilian pepper. There was Brazilian pepper, pepper yeah. Australian pepper pine. Yeah. So Air potatoes, whatever. Yeah. Okay. There was yeah. invasive, they have, invasive species. Invasive. Yeah. And they have more to do on that. Um, and they have obligations to do a one-time removal of the entire park for exotic invasives. Uh, we are assisting in that effort right now because we want to clear some areas that have a, a lot of Brazilian pepper for the temporary parking that we're, we're creating. Um, but they have an extensive amount of to do throughout the entire property. And then in perpetuity, they will be responsible for the exotic removal in the conservation area. It will be in future years upon the city to do the exotic removal in the remainder. In addition to that, they, per the agreement, uh, they do have um, some acres of native plantings that they will be responsible for as well. 
And that's under the interlocal agreement. Yes. Yeah. So all of that, the, the FCT agreement, if I can answer your question from a contract perspective, is we're all jointly involved in the FCT agreement for the reimbursement of the acquisition costs. And then how that's divided is in the parties, is in the county and city's interlocal agreement that you all approved in 2020. Yeah. Um, and if that's going to change, then that will require an amendment to that interlocal agreement. But as st that's how it's currently structured with the county getting back 1.5 and then everything else going into the project. No, we love our partner, the county. They've been mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that all the questions on the FCT piece of this? All right. Um, so then we have the piece that is um, the lake. Let's, let's just go right to the lake because that should be quick. Um, Jennifer is looking for some consensus direction to pursue this avenue, right? All right. Do you bring back something to us when it happens? Yes, we'll bring back a purchase and sale. You, you'd receive a, okay. a, a purchase and sale agreement for your approval. Gotcha. Okay, so we'll see this again. We're just giving consensus direction or not to you will spend time to go do this. Correct, yes. Okay. And also, Bruce Worth, who was the exec executive director of Swift Mud, correct? Yes, he was. Yeah. Deputy. 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 <laughs> You're going to make two. this happen, right? Right. Okay. And so he is a good in for us with Swiss Mud if you authorize us to move forward. All right. Well, hang on. Look, let's go ahead and approve the FCT agreement. Let's then do the consensus, and then we can open it up for the master planning and all. I'm sure there are lots of little questions on that. All right. So can I um, – anybody wish to come forward and speak to the agreement or the consensus to purchase the lake? All right. Can I have a motion to approve the FCT agreement? So moved. Second. Okay. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Franey and Commissioner Gow. All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. And then can I have a motion, or can I have a, a I'm going to take a motion, so it's very official. Yeah. Can I have a motion to give direction to our staff to pursue the purchase of Jerry Lake? I make that motion. Okay, Commissioner, Commissioner Kynes and Commissioner Franey. All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Okay, now I know we're gonna um, probably have a lot of questions on the, the whole master plan. So I'll, Vice Mayor, I'll start with you. Well, um, what's the difference between, you know, I just don't like concrete, I'm sorry. What's the difference between crushed concrete and crushed shell? Well, the crushed concrete is recycled, and um, it's a, a product that the county uses quite a bit to stabilize their tra trails. And so the choice would have been shell or the crushed concrete. And my preference, basically, I think the crushed crush concrete does a, a better job, and it doesn't get all over your shoes and your car. And so I, I, I feel like that um, my decision on that was made based on what the county's using and also my experience with Shell. Maybe you can send us a quick picture, like the difference between the two. Yeah. And it's recycled, so it is an environmentally. Okay, that's what I'm getting yeah. at. You know, just to say concrete, nah, no. I don't like it. I felt the same way when I you know, talked to Paul Kazi about, until I went out and looked at a couple of his parks. Uh -huh. and said, and he but I guess uh, my question is, is it really, is it truly environmentally sensitive? I understand what you're saying. It's a reuse item, so you are reusing Something. Well, and that's kind of a good thing to tell. Yeah, and that is a good thing to tell. But you will send us a picture or But, of course, I mean, it is such a beautiful, pristine, wild area. You know, I... I you wouldn't really know the difference. Okay, well, but, but then if I wouldn't really know the difference, I have to see. Yeah, you know, send it, us it's, a picture. It's difficult to explain to me something that I could... You can't touch, visualize. See, yeah. you know. And maybe send us like the closest park that we can go see it in person or something. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be good. That'd be great. Deborah can take her walker. <laughs> yeah, I can take my walker. <laughs> yeah. How does Sorry, it I just walkers? had that. I couldn't resist. It doesn't do yeah. well with walkers. And we this. actually started yeah. put, putting it down in, in the park. We just started. So I can share it with you if you want to come right out to the um, preserve. We can, we can do that as well. Or I can take you to Wall Springs. You know, um, in that same vein, I just saw that they are providing wheelchair access now to, and they have that 
the wheelchairs, access to some of our beaches. Mm -hmm. Could we do something like that? I mean, have wheelchairs that would be able to do that terrain? Um, you know, that, that would be a great idea. I, I have been really interested in that, the, the special wheelchairs that they use for the beaches. I don't know if we're doing it in Honeymoon or uh, Caladesi, but I think it's, maybe I saw it at Clearwater Beach. I think it was Clearwater Beach. It might have been Indian Rocks. It's, a couple of them are doing it because I saw, saw an article where they, some folks were saying that they needed more. Clearwater, yeah. Yeah, Clearwater. Yeah, some pla Can we look some into that? making them uh, assess available to the public to use, but there I believe it's also a Moby mat material that's well. Yeah, obviously, we want to Explore. cue in the ADA committee um, to get their thoughts and ideas. Well, that would be the decking, wouldn't it? The walk, the wood walkways. We're doing wood walkways. The, At some uh, point, these we are, I'm are, talking about we? the stabilizing the the trails. Yeah, right now, yes. that's what you're gotcha. doing, but in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that right now that the effort as far as to get it open is to get the public on the property. Right. right. And then there are all sorts of other things that, that Vince was talking about, other improvements we need to make. And and we'll fold this into that discussion if you don't mind. Right now we gotta get it open. I got it. No. I just you know, I can't help myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner? Yeah, Vince when you talked about and in the video you showed the kind of the roadway and the fact that you kind of needed to widen it. Are there any best practices from the environmental or the conservation side on how wide that road needs to be? And if, if it's not too, and maybe instead of two lines, you just have a pull off spots to where it's a one lane road, but a car can pull off to allow another one or a couple to get through, just to kind of minimize the impact on the environment. Well, let me just state that for the entrance that we're doing now, we're dictated by Pinellas County uh, coming through their right of way. So that's why it's as wide as it is right now with the turn lanes, et cetera. So we're, we're looked at as a commercial. Uh, what are you talking about? You're not talking about the entrance inside the park. Right. I'm just saying okay. that, that one there. But then once, <laughs> get, like, what? No, once we get past. The, You're talking about Virginia. Yes. Okay. I, I think I'm he's talking about I'm saying once we get past the, there, then it's, it's you know, we, we could look at the different options in terms of what the, you know, ultimately what the access will be. Aren't you talking um, about the inside of the on park? On that gravel yeah. road. He's talking about the inside of the park, not the outside of the park. Well, well that's what I'm talking So once you get past the fence, you know, what you have now is a, a stone single road. entrance. Right. Si single lane. Um, it's cl clearance wide right now. It's wide enough to put a, a standard two lane road. I mean, vegetation wise. So you can, you can, Footprint wise, you would not have to remove any trees or vegetation to do that. Yeah, because we don't want to remove speak those, to that uh, as well. whatever those things are that are along either side of the road. What are those big, tall pine sort of looking bushes? They're gone. So internal within the park, yeah. there were some arborvitae um, that lined the edges of the roadways in, in, on the inside of the fence, and those are not native to Florida. You um, didn't remove them, did you? They're not there now, but they're not they're not native. So our goal was to widen oh them. Oh my God! Are you kidding me? You took those we, beautiful tall things on either side of the road out. Am I? I think you're thinking of even I further don't know what in. They're, they're they're big tall things on either side of the road. You're you're thinking further into the to the project. We didn't remove any major trees as soon as you enter that fence line. So all the big trees are still there, and you know it was what only I'm small about? stuff. I'm still not convinced that I'm not going to be upset. Do you know what I'm he's talking about? Big, he's wearing big, tall trees. Okay. Non-indigenous. Okay, we're talking about the regular road that right now the Hackworths use to get to the back house. That's the road we're talking about, right? right. Just making sure I'm understanding. And along that road, because Gladys Douglas has many pictures of her standing along those big trees. <laughs> I'm sure that Craig would not take something I out that he shouldn't. You have, I have confidence. But anything that was removed was in, in, was invasive. Was not native to Florida. Right. Um, halfway back, you have red cedar that were tall indigenous trees that lined the road. And then closer towards Virginia, you had some smaller arborvitae. 
or more yeah, I don't shrub. Know I don't know. What, I don't know what their names are. So, I just... But the, there, there's other major, like large established trees that are there, and those are far outside of even if you wanted to put a three-lane road there. I mean, there's plenty of room, and anything that would have been protected was protected, or anything that should have been protected was okay. protected. I'm going out there today because I'm not convinced that we're talking the same <laughs> language. Um, deep breath. Deep breath. Well, I think breath. what we all want to know is when, could, because. I, I'm gonna tell you, I think we're all very protective about what happens there. And there are things happening that we haven't seen or talked about. And I know it's administrative. I understand that it's, you know, trying to get it open to the public. But I think we all, I'm sorry, I think we're gonna be real picky and, and wanna know what those things are before they get done. Like parking, where's the parking gonna be? Where's this parking lot gonna be? As you come into the main drive of Virginia, and you go about maybe 30 yards uh, on your left-hand side. Uh, it opens up. There was all these Brazilian peppers there that we removed and opened up a nice parking area that Craig was, and I were just out there the other day. We can get 20, 25 cars in that, in that area. And you could also park some cars along the side of the road as well. Are we pursuing the corner of Virginia and CR1, that area that has much of nothing there? Are we pursuing any of that at this point or? Pursuing it in terms of? Parking or? No, not, not in order to get the park open. So what, what we'll do, Mayor, is you have a lot of questions, so I'd like to actually come back to you with, with a diagram of what's going where and what we've done so far. That was my question, yeah. schematic of what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's really helps important. A lot. I think right we're going to yeah. we can, be very uh, careful. Jennifer, if you're cautious. okay, we do have um, the master plan. Right. In, in phases coming in, if you'd yeah. like us to, to show yeah. that. Well, sure. and we haven't seen that either. So no. that, was, seen that was a question, when will we see? Well, you know what I, I would like to do, though, if it's all right with all of you, is I think we need to come back with the whole thing, with the master plan, with what we're doing now, what we're, you know, the nuisance species and that type of a thing. We'll look at whether or not we have room at our next workshop. But, um, you know, everything well, we're doing is in accordance with, you know, obviously FCT and, and what we've talked about before as far as the pathway that we're putting in. And, right. You know, even, even if we don't have the master plan, because I know that's, that's a big undertaking or whatever, but mm. even if we have, like you said, a, a diagram yeah. of what you're doing yeah. now, I think that'll at least get us mm -hmm. to the next step. But we, we do need to have a timeline. And maybe when you bring that diagram back, you can give us a timeline on what we're thinking for the other it, it, we can do that, but as you know, the FCT, we don't, we're don't, you know, probably not going to get the money for about a year, and, and you know, so that the timeline will, we would assume that it would be at that year level, you know. So, uh, and we'd ha be happy to put something together for you as far as if we no, get we the can. money by X, Y, Z, then, then this is how long, you know, the rest of it will take us. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is just letting us know what's happening as it happens. So, I mean, so we're, we, we know, okay, right now you're clearing this or this for parking, just to, so we know what's going on out there. So that, you know, this one doesn't hyperventilate if something. I would, if it's all right, Commissioner, Mayor, Vice Mayor, any Commissioner and Commissioner, <laughs> I really would like to bring you the overall plan so that we can just work it, rather than tell you what we're doing incrementally. Um, because we won't have that opportunity. I mean, I could do it under city manager's report or do it via e yeah, no. emails individually, but if we could just do something more comprehensive, I think that that would be appreciated. Well, and at some point we have to determine, um, you know, some community input to those things. Now, we have an agreement. I know I'm not trying to undo that, but I mean, you know what I'm talking about. We maybe help establish a friends group. Yes. Yeah, and we need to talk about that as well. Because you know, there's fundraising as... opportunities. Like if we do boardwalks, you could sell a plank for 150 bucks. Right. Or a bench. You know. Right. Or a bench. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are fundraising operations. So, I mean, we just need to get this stuff kind of rolling. It's been a, been well, a year. The, there's been a lot rolling in between. I mean, there, I know. The, you know, the FCT was, was obviously a lot of work with, with all of our partners and those types of things. So it's really kind of the same with pickleball courts. A lot's been done. And, you know, there are operational issues, yeah. you know, and things like that. But I, I, I see that we need to communicate with you all the overall plan better, and we'd be happy to do that. Well, and I'm not trying to complain. I'm really I know. Not. Yeah. I, I just know we get asked a lot, when is it going to open? And which is why you guys are doing all this stuff very quickly. Right. And we greatly appreciate it. So I, I'm not complaining in any way. I just, I it's the only I, time we get to talk about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, but I do get asked a lot more about pickleball 
pickleball courts. Just right now. <laughs> Yes, that is ro rolling the world right now. Yeah, yeah I get it. And but tennis. Yeah. And, and, oh, and, oh, no, it's all about the balance, right? Well, and I, I think we probably want to have a say on how quickly we want to do these things and what we might give up to get those things done quickly mm -hmm. or if it's going to take us five years to do. You know, mm -hmm. those are the kinds of, that's sort of a policy, more of a policy thing mm -hmm. that I think we are going to want to have some dialogue on. Could, could we maybe look at this? because we do have a year and but we have all the experts you know Craig certainly knows what's non-indigenous invasive um, can we sort of look at it as a living document I mean tell us as you know what you plan to do in what areas but it's going to change because you're going to get out there and you're going to say well we do need to deal with this particular issue of invasives or, you know, I, I can be wrong on the, the crushed concrete, but if we have an idea, even if it's a living document, we're good. Yeah, we start with something. I think that's what they're working on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Vince just whispered in my ear very effectively <laughs> that we can put up a, a, we do have a PowerPoint that shows you the amenities, the first phase of the amenities, correct? Because we would like to get started on the first phase yeah. as a result of this discussion today. So, you know, we, we got to get the pub, to get it open. I think that our mission critical is to get it open. So, cool. yeah, go ahead. Um, up on the screen, you'll see. Uh, Lena, can you start from the beginning? See if I, my mouse, okay. So, um, just to orient you, um, this is the, the driveway coming in on the bottom of the map is Virginia, um, and you have CR1 out here on the left side. Um, so these bright white lines that you see coming all through here, uh, those were the trails that Pulte made for us um, that we are going to take advantage of and keep and utilize those as the trails, the for now trails through the park. So that's what we're working on stabilizing right now to make sure that they are safe and accessible to the public. Um, we are, right now, you'll see this red and white striped area. There is a gate um, that is an electric gate that is right here off the entrance from Virginia. Um, eventually, we will relocate that gate um, to this part right here. So what you have back in this top right corner is what we call just the residential portion. It is fenced off. Um, the orange square that you see right here is the mobile home that the caretakers are in. Uh, the top uh, brown structure that you see at the top is the residential building. And then to the right of that is the what is referred to as the recreational room. And the green square here is the tennis courts. Um, so that area will continue to remain fenced off when we are able to open the up uh, for the first phase um, to get basic, what we're calling basic public access to the park. Um, so this is what we were showing in here. Um, there are some, as Craig mentioned, some, some small shrubbery that was removed, uh, but no, there were no trees that were removed. <coughs> We're getting this area um, so that you can get cars in and out safely. Um, in this corner right here was um, an area that was kind of open, uh, but had some bushes in the middle, and they were all uh, Brazilian peppers. So staff is working on right now removing those Brazilian peppers, and this is the area that Vince was referring to, to be able to put um, a couple dozen cars potentially uh, and we're getting that stabilized as well because these are very soft sandy soils uh, so to put either cars or pedestrians in them you have to <coughs> something to stabilize them uh, so the red line that you see throughout here that is what you saw in the video is that conservation fencing so the area to the north um, and there was this kind of island in the middle here uh, that had that rosemary area that we want to protect uh, so we have that all cornered off so that people can see it, but they can't touch it. 
Uh, so the conservation of fence is in there. Uh, and then we will also, um, there are up, this is the corner of the mayor that you were referring to up on Virginia, that we will be able to put in some pedestrian access and more formalize because at this point it kind of gets ambiguous which way to go. So we will formalize some pedestrian access out to the corner there. So you will have pedestrian access and we'll put up as when we some, these are the little blue things you see here, some signage to let people know once the park is open for that first phase. Probably put some bike racks in there too. Yes. I was going to say, are you yes. even, have so you considered the parking on the corner? We did talk with the county um, there are, there were challenges in that. Uh, we couldn't have a turn off, uh, before there is a right turn lane there. Right. Mm -hmm. So the turn off would actually have to have come all the way back here. Oh, um, gotcha. and then we'd have to basically no, create a two lane road to get to that. So it, it logistically was much easier for us to implement the temporary parking up in here. Okay. Yeah, and again, that's temporary parking. We are looking at doing permanent parking. No, I know. On the and residential. Well, that'll be part of our bigger, yeah. broader discussion. Yes. Okay, any other questions or comments? Um, this is great. This is really, really helpful. Yeah, um, we should have put that up to begin with. Yeah, it, it's great. I probably answered all our questions, um, other than the mayor going to go out and check on the trees. That's why he whispered in my ear desperately. I'm going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask you, and now you're flipping it. Like, well, how? where will ultimately the access to the water be? To the water? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so like that's the next one. Yeah, yeah so. five or six slides. Oh, yeah, good. So, okay. Okay. Eventually, and this is when the FCT grant was submitted to the state, we articulated to them not only the different amenities, but where those amenities would go. Uh, so as Vinch mentioned, uh, the eventual air idea is to have the parking lot where the tennis courts are. The recreation room is that nature center uh, that uh, the county is committed to having. We would have, at, in this general location, that's where all of our utilities are, so that's where our restrooms would be picnic shelters. Uh, this is the space where the lean-tos currently are, uh, that we would convert that space into picnic shelters. Again, connecting this white line is connecting those trails. Um, we have some uh, area here um, that we launch. would be able to have the canoe kayak launch. And then currently where you saw like the boat launch area where we had the signing party, we're looking at that area for the fishing pier. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this is the observation platform that we're looking at that is in the heart of the, uh, the rosemary scrub that everybody wants to see. But this is the general layout. Stuff may shift here or there. Uh, we um, want to keep the canoe kayak launch as close as possible to the rec room because uh, the idea is to have that kayak vendor operate out of that facility. So all the amenities you see on the right-hand side are the ones that were in my narrative, and yep. uh, we just saved this for to look at last. Okay. To show you actually on a. Any plane. other questions or comments, Mayor? If I may. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Just for comparison, and Craig, you might be able to mention this. The especially if the, we get the purchase of the lake, the the total area of the Gladys Douglas Preserve versus Hammock Park. That's Gladys Douglas is 44 acres. I'm not sure what a right, hammock so is. Close to 100 acres. I mean, yeah, hammock park's close to 100 acres. And if, you know, if we did end up acquiring the lake, it would, even with the borders around the lake, it would be similar in size. 55 acres is a lake in the border. I always thought hammock was like 89 or 88. I, I, thought or was, I was thinking 86 on hammock. Yeah, yeah, and then we there. did the, the, ha the Harris and the OLL property, which brought it closer oh, to 100. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, good point. Nice. Yeah, good so with the marshland. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bruce is saying Jerry Lake is 80. Oh, really? Oh, geez. I thought it was 55. I thought so, too. 80 is well, better. We'll take, deputy. 80. we'll take 80. Mm -hmm. I'm taking what Bruce says. That was good. Anybody Bruce else? Expanded. Bruce, would you have to know <laughs> then uh, north of the lake, from my understanding, there is some swift mud property there as well? It's all. It's all. It's all the Swift same thing. Property. I think what you might be referring to on the north end. Of, that's a good question because at the north end of the lake, uh, there's a control structure right. that was built. This this property was purchased 
in, in cooperation with Swift Mud and Pinellas County, where Swift Mud retained the ownership. The purpose of the purchase was for that flood control project. Uh, and if you've ever been up there, it, it runs the, the length of, of the property from east to west. So there's a berm and there's a structure. Pinellas County is uh, the, the perpetual maintenance and operation entity for that. Uh, that needs to be made clear. There was some question by the public contacted me earlier about what the responsibility would be for the city, and, and you really don't have any. It, it's a very solid uh, agreement. Uh, Pinellas County is under permit to maintain that perpetually. And, and there's some other drainage facilities in the middle of the lake also that the county maintains. Uh, so th that's what you see. Let, let me just point one thing out as you're talking about trails and what, you know, again, what they're showing is what the Gladys Douglas Preserve does for you. But up by the, where you see that square up there where the fishing pier is, right at that corner, the, the, the property for the lake itself is very difficult to get to. The east side is just all yeah. wetlands. But there is a strip of, of, of property that runs yeah. along the west side of the lake all the way to the north. Um, it's, it's high, I mean, it's, it's, it's dry, but it's, I think as the surveyor told me, they, they had one of the most difficult times cutting through the Brazilian pepper to get the, the boundary that we just did. But my point being is that there may be an opportunity on that side too to, to cut a, a nature trail along that and have, you know, points of access along the lake, so. I was really hoping that maybe like they have at Brooker Creek someday, not yeah, anytime soon. This is someday. Right. You know, like in Brooker Creek, what they have is those boardwalks that go through and over the water. I'm not talking about over the lake, but even if it was all the way around it, you know, with, with something environmental friendly materials. Very cool. I mean that would be the ultimate. That would that would I would love to see that. But that's a lot of money and Environmental yeah, permitting, and I can see Jorge going, oh, my God, really? <laughs> well, I'm not going to be canoeing in the lake. I oh, heck that, no. So. <laughs> Too many. Thank you, Bruce. Anybody else? No? Just well, one more continuation. Sure. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Now's your time. Just regarding, regarding that north end, when we were discussing the property in general uh, on, on purchasing it, there was some conversation about that north piece of property also being available for sale. But what I'm hearing now is, you no, know, if it's a perpetual maintenance agreement for the county, that kind of, I'm just concerned about any future development that might occur. I, I, I'm Island. not aware, I, the, the Jerry Lake purchase encompasses what I, I, that structure, it's, it's all one. I'm not aware of any other property, SWIFMA does not own any other property beyond what we're talking about. So I don't think there's anything else to purchase. What's left on the other side of the structure is really uh, what they call channel B. It's just a, a conveyance way. So you, you, there's no you get, there. no. yeah, there's really nothing there to purchase, I don't believe. Uh, so you get the whole package with this purchase. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Um, when you come back. I know you can't answer any of this, but uh, another couple questions that I've been asked a lot about, so we might as well start thinking about it. Uh, I've been asked if dogs on leashes are going to be allowed in the park, and I, I know this might be a different situation given that there's a lot of animals out there, and there's also environmental things. So I'm not saying whether it should or shouldn't be. I'm just saying we, we need to have that dialogue and how that will be. And the other question I've been asked several times is, and again, you're working with the county. Um, how can we get the park golf cart access? So crossing Bell Trees there to Virginia would mean working with the county to allow golf carts on that stretch to cross County Road 1. I'm not asking them to be able to go in the park, but what I'm asking, what a lot of folks have asked is, how can we get there in our golf cart? You know, like, like you would in a car. So if we can at least start talking about those things so I know that we're working on it. Um, and then finally, today the county's meeting is at 2. That's their item on this grant is 26. Is anybody going there? Does anybody need to go there? I wasn't planning on it. Um, I'm not sure it's necessary. You think it's just a run-of-the-mill thing for them? I do. Okay. Okay. 
I haven't. I did talk to Barry Burton, the county administrator, last Thursday. Yeah. And uh, he didn't ask that anybody be there to support it. I think it's. I think it'll be okay. Okay. Anybody else have anything? All right. Why Mayor, Mayor, I did have one thing. Oh, I'm I, sorry. Um, Do you have more? I, I yes. Because um, it says four or four, that's why I thought we were done. The, the, well, I don't have any more to present, but I have a question just sure. for clarification. Um, we started putting down the crushed concrete, and it's out there now. We have our guys working out there now. It's what they use at Wall Springs. It's what they use in the county. It was a rec recommendation from Paul Kazi, my counterpart with the county. Uh, I think it's a better product than using shell. It's recycled. and. If I stop now, I, I need to get a decision made pretty quickly so I can keep this project going. That was just my question, Vince, because I, I don't know a differentiation. I've never seen this stuff, you know? I don't think anybody's telling you to stop. I always thought it was Shell. Yes. So just have somebody take a picture real quick and shoot it to her. Okay. No, I need to go out there in my walker. Okay. Where, where in Wall Springs would we see this? Call Bob and tell him to get his golf cart so he can yeah. pick her up. So there's actually the newer section of Wall Springs, so don't go to the main entrance, the original portion of Wall Springs. Stay on Alt-19. Um, you kind of go a little farther north, and you'll see a turnoff for their, their, their northern portion where the old uh, Girl Scout Girl camp. Scout camp. Yes. When they opened that up, that whole northern portion, they used, they used crushed concrete, which for all intents and purposes, you would say it looks like just really hard dirt, um, so it looks natural in the park. Um, it's, 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 not it's, like it's, rock. A, it's, no, no, no. It's finer than crushed shell. And because it's finer than crushed shell, it compacts better. So it has better stabilization. Um, it, so it, those who have mobility issues can actually traverse it better than crushed shell. I have pictures on my phone. My phone's in my car. I can. And it's pervious. Yeah. Yeah. It looks completely natural. No, no, no. I'm I mean, quite uh, sure she's totally going to be fine with it when she sees the picture. It's, water, send the picture. it's pervious, yes. We'll, we'll, we're not, we're not going to come back for a vote or anything. It's, all fine. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's fine. It's just the curiosity. Yeah. Right. So Thank you. They're able to take, you know, old concrete and crush it up and like give it new life. No, we like yeah. reuse. Yeah. Love we will, we we will like take a reuse. picture and send it to all five of you. Yeah. And let's, um, <laughs> let's make That's sure, said, right? too, <laughs> that we keep, that we keep uh, I know you're taking this stuff to Parks and Rec. As you're doing things, but let's in, let's include ADA and let's include um, in, um, CEQ. And some CEQS, sorry. And some educational signage on, on the crushed concrete so that we're educating the public. Yeah, that it's a reuse it project. And it's product, recycling. And that it is environmentally, environmentally sensitive. Yes. That's what okay. we want. All right, let's take a break. <laughs> Thank you, guys.
We've got um, roughly 45 minutes. Everybody, we've got about 45 minutes to get through until we get to all the updates and different things. So let's try to fix you managing your time. Trying. Hey, I knew that, that the GDP was going to be a, a discussion. I just knew that. <laughs> What what gave you that impression? Well, because we well because we're all very passionate about it, and we haven't talked about it in a long time, and we're all getting asked questions. So I just I, I totally, knew it would be something. I was I was um, totally agreeing with you, yeah. Mayor. <laughs> okay. Um, our next item is the lien reduction request for the property located at twenty seven one seven Resnick Circle, um, in the amount of five hundred and four thousand and change. Um, who's doing an opening? George, can George? you do it? Okay, George. Yes, presenter. All yours. Uh, thank you. Good morning. George King on behalf of the Community Development Department. Um, this is, uh, as the mayor mentioned, a lien amnesty request uh, that we reviewed pursuant to our resolution, our current resolution 21-09. Uh, it's brought by the property owner, Elena P. Ziegler, uh, for the property at 2717 Resnick Circle. Uh, Ms. Ziegler is represented by her attorney, and uh, he's sitting here, and I know he'll want to speak uh, briefly about the, uh, the uh, uh, property and the, and the disposition of the request. Pursuant to Section 2D of the City's Lien Reduction Resolution, the Code Compliance Division does affirm uh, that all the violations that were a part of this request have been mitigated and no longer exist. They included uh, basically missing and or peeling paint, um, swimming pool maintenance and vegetative growth. And uh, you probably see the pictures in your backup. It's a very nice property, uh, actually in a nice neighborhood and is very well kept at this point. This does date back to 2015, which is, uh, you know, a longstanding, um, a longstanding application that really comes forward because of this resolution and the ability of, the, the, of, the, of this commission to offer this kind of disposition and amnesty. Um, the applicant does qualify for a reduction pursuant to the resolution. Uh, in our initial staff evaluation, as you know in the resolution, there's kind of a three-part test that we go through as a staff. Um, and when we did that determination, we came up with a 50% reduction that we were recommended to the city manager. Uh, obviously, that 50% reduction would get you from a little bit more than $500,000 to about two hundred and fifty, dollars which is still a relatively large sum of money. So... Henceforth, uh, the applicant and the uh, applicant's attorney has asked to come forward to the commission to talk about the financial hardship application that the resolution permits. And that's what they're here to do today. So with that, I'm going to kind of step aside maybe, unless you have questions of me, and allow the applicant to kind of talk a little no. bit about we'll what's going first. on. Welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, uh, Commissioners. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to argue uh, our amnesty application. Ms. Ziegler is here uh, at the meeting as well. She's uh, sitting in the back of the room. Um, you know, we, I will say sort of tangentially here, uh, I am currently the president of my homeowners association, and I'll be quick. Uh, and I was listening at the beginning of the meeting during the, the public comment portion about the pickleball and tennis courts. And for what it's worth, West Chase is having the exact same discussion in our 3,500 home community. So I, I sympathize with where you're at and we're dealing with those same issues. Sort of along those same lines, uh, as a board, when we're looking at homes in our community in violation, the goal is... Uh, maintenance. The goal is upkeep. The goal is correction of the problems. And as has been pointed out, that was that was done here. The problem that you all have that that we completely understand is this is is a long lasting or, or a violation that occurred a while back, back in 2015. The reason that it took so long to be corrected, uh, Mr. Ziegler was the one in the in the marriage in the relationship that handled most of the aspects of this home. Now, at the time the violations occurred, the Zigglers lived in Illinois. They did not live in the home. Uh, Mr. Ziggler passed uh, December 11 of 2020. And upon his passing and going through the information, by that point, Ms. Ziggler did uh, live in the house uh, here in, in Dunedin, Palm Harbor, uh, did live in the house. And when she discovered the violations, they were cured in, in a relatively short period of time. It took uh, about less than a year. I believe the documents show compliance as of September of 2021. And so within a year of his passing, 
uh, everything was brought into compliance. And so we would uh, request that that factor be taken into account in, in your analysis. Um, in addition, you know, as, as we've already heard, $250,000 is a significant uh, fine. There is a mortgage on the property. My understanding is that the balance of that mortgage is about uh, $230,000 approximately. Uh, Pinellas County, the property appraiser, values this property at about $354,000 plus or minus, and you know, we can all take into account uh, whether the property values are going to be more or less than what the Pinellas County appraiser says based on uh, price appreciation. Uh, I did give in my uh, initial uh, amnesty letter application to the city, I did include some financial information for Ms. Ziegler. She is now 85 years old. She is a widow. Uh, and I did give you, uh, as best we could, her expenses. Her mortgage payment is approximately $2,100. You know, the water electric bill, she's got a life insurance policy. She does have medical insurance uh, in a significant amount, which is understandable given her, given her age. Um, you know, internet cable, phone bills, credit card on average minimum payments. The pool and lawn care, which is designed to keep the property in compliance. Her food and grocery bills on average. So um, we, we are here to ask, you know, the property is in compliance. We're dealing with uh, an 85-year-old widow who is doing her best to keep this property in compliance. Uh, she cured it immediately upon her knowledge that the violation existed. Admittedly, it went on for far too long before it was cured, but as soon as she found out, she cured it. And so, um, and for all, so for all those reasons, I, I understand uh, what the city manager can recommend based on the formulas, but we're asking for a little bit more help than that uh, if possible. Okay. Um, the violations were, George, uh, just repeat uh, them. The violations were uh, missing and or peeling paint, um, the pool, um, the swimming pool maintenance, and vegetative growth. So just general growth, typically okay. in that back area around that pool. All right. I'm just trying to set this up for a productive conversation. Okay. So. Um, Nikki, according to our current regulations, right, um, our city manager can't go beyond what what is being presented to us, right? Is that right? Under your resolution that you adopted, um, the city manager only has authority up to a certain point, and then it would come back to you. This is a lien because the liens run in favor of the governing body. So you delegated a certain portion of the authority to the city manager up to her purchasing authority, the same in equal amount. Um, and then anything and greater that than what? that comes to you for, you for your consideration. It. This is a discretionary decision. Your liens are in place to um, inspire and ensure compliance. Um, appliant, compliance has been achieved in this case. And then the, there are a number of factors that you listed in the resolution that the city commission indicated it would be willing to consider. Um, financial ability was one of the factors that you can consider, and you've heard some information on that today. Um, and but it is ultimately your decision um, of what you want to do with your lien. Okay, and in the past, normally these kinds of things were handled through the code enforcement or code compliance board. But um, now that we've changed things, redu you know? lien reductions have always run in favor of you as the governing body. Right. Um, they they were, I th you know, I think with the resolution, the city um, commission attempt and. and was attempting to um, present some predictable benchmarks for um, people to use who maybe have had uh, uh, issues in the past and have, or, or property has changed hands and now the property is in the hands of a productive um, neighbor and property owner. And so the commission gave some predictive benchmarks for the city com for the city manager to apply administratively. But these have always come back to you. They may have just come back to you in some form of a previously negotiated settle well, that's a what, settlement. That's um, what happened. Our right. previous city attorney would negotiate all of this stuff and, bring it back. and then bring it back. Yeah. And there was no perceived limit. You, you, that's that's how it came. So it was almost run of the mill when we would have it here. It didn't require a lot of discussion because it had gone through whatever particular process it went through. Um, 
So, so what, what I wanted to do is ask my colleagues, and, and we don't have to, this is up to everybody, I don't feel comfortable negotiating up here. I, I, would, I would like to ask our city manager to go back and give her the authority to negotiate a, some kind of a flat rate, go through that process, because I don't like the idea of us negotiating here. And that's and what I feel like back. we, well, and then I just feel like that's what we're doing it's here. It's not a real negotiation. They're asking for a waiver of the, what's the percentage amount? Is it 100%? 100%, 100%. but yet the right. city has taken a position of 50. And so we are essentially in a negotiation now. And I, I just don't feel comfortable doing that right here. I think- Unless we just say no. Right. And so I kind of feel, she's done what, uh, she, I don't mean to say she, our city manager has done, um, you know, what she can under her authority. And, and she and our team felt strongly about that number. I don't feel comfortable us having that whole debate up here. I, I think we need I do that. have a couple questions. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so I just want to understand, um, well, first of all, I mean, philosophically, and this will help you if you negotiate, um, philosophically, you know, my concern, I'll say this to Mrs. Ziegler and, and the attorney, you know, my concern is always if it goes back to 2015, and this is a really nice neighborhood, what, what was the impact on the neighborhood and the people that actually live with that for a long time? Understood that Mrs. Ziegler wasn't in control of that, her husband was doing it, but still that accountability is still there. Um, the underst um, Mrs. Ziegler now lives in the home? Yes. Okay. Um, and so obviously the, the whole issue of giving a reduction based on how quickly it was done is, is kind of off the table, even though I guess, again, you could argue as soon as Mrs. Ziegler knew how bad it was, she got right on it. So, you know, there's some play in there. Um, I, I want to understand from staff the previous code violations. There's a 0% with that. Does that mean there were other violations before this particular violation? It, it would be after. So in between 2015 and 2022, I don't have those with me, Commissioner, but I can, I'll certainly go back and take a look at that. I think that's one of the things that um, the attorney had asked as well. And uh, jo as you know, Joan McHale from my staff puts that together. So she goes back through the records um, and kind of uh, provides that information related to that chart. I don't have it with me though, so I can't give you the specifics. So we don't know. But I could certainly go back and investigate that as part of a negotiation yeah. process. I mean, because again, that, that plays into it. It wasn't yep. just a property that sat there with the neighbors having to deal with this thing for basically seven years, six years. Mm -hmm. um, it also had other violations. So do I think $250,000 is, is a fair amount? That seems pretty steep, particularly since it's been brought into compliance. And Mrs. Ziegler, you seem like a nice woman who's trying to do the right thing. Um, but do I think it should just be, no, we just give it all away? No, I don't, because I think, again, it's about that message for the future to other people. Um, so I, I'm not sure what that balance well, I, is, I'm but I agree the with- same way, but I, I, I just I, feel like it no. shouldn't be done here. And that's what I was, I'm agreeing with you, because actually one of my thoughts was, you know, kind of lay out our feelings, but then I think go back to the table and, pick, and come up with some reasonable um, compromise that would be, you know, fair. I do have a question. On the pool, was it a black pool? Was it non-fenced? I mean, that was one of the violations. That That is a health, safety, and welfare. Yeah, Vice Mayor, I, I'm not sh It was a maintenance issue. I'm not sure if it was a totally bl black pool. That's typically when our code enforcement folks get involved, though. That's usually when they get the call. So I would certainly assume that's the case. I'd have to go back and research the violation. The, though. I have, one of the documents in your package uh, is the statement of violation um, trying to see if this is dated. Uh, looks to be dated in November of 2015. What it says specifically about the pool, uh, the swimming pool is not being maintained in a clean and sanitary manner. The pool water is green in color. Uh, Pinellas County Mosquito Control advised the pool is breeding mosquitoes and will be treating the same. That's what the city of Dunedin code enforcement said in terms of the pool. Yeah, that document's not in our package. I uh, I, I mean, I have a copy of it. Um, that's all right. That's okay. But that's what it says about the pool. Um, you know, this is a new process. 
And I think as we have new processes that we're going to have to uh, look at them and tweak at them. I am not personally uh, willing to throw out a number. Um, I think that there are some real valid questions uh, as to whether there were further uh, compliance issues. That's a very valid question. Um, uh, I Maybe we've answered the pool and maybe we haven't answered the pool, but that's something that really bothers me. That's not like overgrown vegetation. It's a health, safety, and welfare. So, um, you know, so saying that, um, I would give our attorney and city manager the ability to go back and negotiate this with the further information that is needed to complete the picture. Jeff, anything? I concur. John? I believe that I have a responsibility um, as a representative of the, of the people. We, we have a document that states how this is to, to function. And we did the 50% authorization here. So I have to ask some questions, I think. Um, there was a hardship, there's a requirement or they can apply for a hardship. And so therefore then the burden of, of, of conversation, I use that word, uh, would be to show that there's a hardship here of inability to pay. Do we need to change this whole document? Because then I need to ask some additional questions about the hardship. For example, um, she had owned other property. Um, are there other assets involved that have not been disclosed? It sounds to me like we're say, stating that that there is a disclosure of what's a, of what of what her requirements are, and from a cash standpoint, without any details, so I'm not sure what that is yet. Um, and so that's a question. Um, and then, second of all, uh, I wanted to ask a, another question, probably the, of the city attorney up here before we. Uh, or this is what I had wanted to ask, and that was, can we put this on the sale of the property, the uh, the additional sum of monies that whatever whatever we had decided, if we had sat up here and decided that, well, okay, we think it's some other number or it's a number, could we have then said we believe there's a hardship here, um, but but we feel we need to comply with our own our own documentation, our own ordinances, our own requirements. Could we have put that subject to the sale of the property? And I think that would, was, was a question I was thinking to address to you. Which In other words, if there's going to be a fine, could we have that I fine? understand your second question. Your Thank first you. question, the, the city commission had put this code amnesty resolution in place for, the, for one year. That one year renewal period is coming up on June 1st, 2022. So yes, to the commissioner, Commissioner Kynes' point, this was a one year amnesty program to see what, how it worked and the procedures. Right. The city manager in making a recommendation to the city commission um, that, is, that exceeds $50,000 is able to take into consideration the property owner's financial ability to pay. But the procedure that's spelled out on the resolution is that if there's a request for a lien reduction exceeding that $50,000 amount, she will bring it to you at a upcoming agenda meeting with her recommendation, which is what you have before you today. Based on the factors that are in your resolution, which are the same factors that the code compliance board applies in considering the appropriate matters for the amount of the initial fine, the severity and gravity of the violation, the length of time that it took into compliance and any previous violations um, committed by the property owner. Those are the three benchmarks that you've instructed to her to apply and bring back before you for recommendation. If you want to change that, this is your resolution and you can do with it whatever you want. These are your liens. You can do with them what you want. We have presented this as a way to try to structure the goals of the overall code enforcement system, which include those three factors that I mentioned. Um, but yes, this is your resolution and you can't, you can't change it today because you have to change all your resolutions in writing, but that's exactly why you asked us to bring back um, and, and staff and the city attorney's office to bring back a report in June. To your second question, um, which is whether or not you can make the city commission's willingness to reduce the lien 
rather than the um, your current resolution states that if the lien is reduced, the applicant shall have 90 days from the date of approval to pay the reduced amount of the lien. And if not paid within that time, it would revert, revert to the original amount. So if the commission wanted to consider including that it would consider um, reductions that could be payable upon sale, that would be a tweak um, that you could make to the resolution. Um, and it's also one, though, too, that, that, that if that is something that helps the parties come together on this particular um, lien reduction, um, then, then that is something that could be presented. These are still your liens. The only way to, this is one way to compromise them. You also have authority to agree to something different if that works. But again, that's kind of, so, sorry, Joe, just add yeah, to no, that. Again, that's kind of another good reason why we're to looking revert at back it. and go to the city manager and say we're giving you further authorization to try to negotiate some of this based on when it would be payable. I mean, that's, that's all part of a negotiation. And that's kind of something I think we don't want to get into on the dais. Yeah, because do, do, we want to change, do we want to change the whole resolution then? I don't think we know. Well, it's, that's, it's not coming that's not what we're determining. Decide. That's not what we're determining no. today. But it's coming up in June. It's yeah. coming. And this yeah. will all be, yeah. you know, our thought, thought through. But your question yeah. on assets was, I had that as well. I'm yeah. glad you brought it up. And I didn't, yeah. That's something that we don't want to talk about out here. No. That ought to be talked about behind the scenes. Well, there and private personal things. Right. That and I didn't um, hear any requests regarding deferral of time. So that's another reason why, you know, that. <clears throat> well, but yeah. they didn't ask because they went to a 0%. <laughs> that's a different situation. So you wouldn't need less more time to pay zero. Less administrative expenses. So, so there are always administrative, ex so, so any of the lien reductions do not reduce below the administrative uh, expenses to prosecute the code lien and the administrative expenses to release the lien. So I wanted to ask those questions of you so that if we wanted to change anything here, that we would then change it and not just throw it, not throw it that we would just leave, just say, oh, we don't want to do this, let's turn this over here. Do we need to look at this and say, maybe we should, maybe we need to, to reconsider this, this resolution at this point in time? The commission's already asked that the resolution be brought back for reconsideration on June 1st, 2022. Yeah. So um, given that the year's almost up and that was the direction, and thank you for bringing that up, Nikki, we were going to bring you back a full report on the amnesty program because it's actually been working really well. Um, in now, this, this, not to interrupt you, but this is a little bit of a different situation because right. in, the, in the amnesty cases, it's all been new purchasers who are going to be new, different kind of residents and fixing up properties for the most part. This is somebody that's actually, that has owned and living in the home and staying in the home. We, so we that, had, I think that's where it comes right. different. And we have had some that's, that's within my delegated authority that, that they have been in the home with a lien on, on the home. And, and traditionally in that case, um, when we've reduced, it's been they're, they're destitute and they've got no equity in the home. They've got, you know, those types of things. So um, what I'm understanding, and I know we're right in the middle of city commission comments, but just so I understand so far, uh, what, Mayor, what you'd like to do is for staff to, ne to negotiate. It's not 252000 which is 50%. It's not zero, right. which is what I'm hearing so far. Um, but also to Nikki's point that the resolution says the city commission has to approve it. You would bring it back yeah, and right. negotiate mm -hmm. it, similarly you, to right. what Tom used to do. I mean, we would get a memo mm -hmm. and it would say we've come to this negotiation. Mm -hmm. Based mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, based on right. what we think is right. whatever. Yeah. And, I mean, a lot of times we didn't even ask a question because we mm -hmm. know they did all this stuff that we're trying to ask. Got it. Is everybody okay with that? I am. Well, yeah. we're really changing the resolution. No, it's, no, I think aren't no. We? we have we have flexibility within the current resolution. Oh I no, think that's what it's yeah, about. no. Well, I mean, essentially asking for an additional recommendation by the city manager. I don't because think we have that the that's to waive. right. Oh, okay. And ultimately, that negotiation with a recommendation will come back to you. So the resolution is yeah, we'll still have to approve it, but right. Okay. And I can't speak to the benchmarks that were applied in prior negotiations. I know you you know that, but I have no idea what happened in those negotiations. I don't think there were benchmarks. <laughs> well, I do think they were, but I'm not going to say them in public. Right. Cool. You okay with that? Yeah. Commissioner Bessemer, you yes. okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. John? Yeah. Okay. So we are going to throw this back at our city manager and George oh, okay. and, and whoever... Uh, 
is involved to look at some of those outstanding questions and um, have a negotiation. I think it's clear how we all feel. We don't think it can be zero, right. but it needs to be a number. I think we just don't know which number it should be based on further history, further violations, further look into financial well-being, all of those things. Mm -hmm. Everything. 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 All, all the appropriate things to look at. Yeah. And we appreciate the time, and, and I think realistically, I, I didn't expect to walk out of here with 0%. Um, so uh, we appreciate your time, and, and I'll work with, with the city manager and city staff and city attorney. And of course, we appreciate that the, the violations have been corrected. Right. We really do appreciate that. So, all right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That was a great comment, Mayor. That's our overall goal. Yeah, our overall goal is that, and we do appreciate that. Okay, so now we have uh, a purchase of furniture for New City Hall in approximately $700,000 amount. Uh, I know Nicole is here, we but... We have Nicole Delfino. Hey, Nicole. We'll be doing the presentation. All right, and I'm just reminding everybody that we have about 20 minutes to get through this and the other items on our agenda. Mayor, I can waive my report as well, and I'll transmit no, it to no, the commission you if to you'd like. We'll, okay. we'll get to it. We're just going to be good. We're going to be super fast. Yeah. <laughs> good morning, Mayor and Commissioner. Nicole Delfino here. I have with me today uh, Nola uh, from Harvard Jolly. She's been our interior designer uh, working on this project. Uh, so I'm going to pass over to her temporarily to talk about the furniture uh, going into the building. Thank you for having me. Um, I just want to give you a little background how we ended up where we did with the furniture that we are, are, uh, have selected. We went with KI or Kruger in International as the basis of design. The reason why we did that was it is on state of Florida contract. It is an open market manufacturer, so any dealer can deal it because we wanted to leave the, uh, that open for as many people to um, put their hat in the ring to try to uh, get this project. And although KI does have high-end products, they are considered a uh, mid-range price level manufacturer. So they're not the most expensive, but they're also not the least expensive. And just to let you know, the uh, what we was selected, you'll see later in the presentation, um, the, that case good line is their most cost effective uh, product that they offer. Um, and it's very durable. Um, all of the desks that you'll see have lifetime warranty and all the fabrics, we did not specify any leather or anything that was exorbitant. They're all vinyl or fabric and they are very durable. They've passed all the tests that prove how durable they are which we can obviously provide you with that information if you need. Um, and we actually have this manufacturer in our office. It's a very cost-effective, very durable product. So Thank you. with that, we'll take a quick look at some of the items that we selected. Um, this is the lobby layout. Um, we show, you know, a series of kind of... Okay. I know, this microphone. <laughs> uh, we show a, a, a setup of um, a mixture of chairs, some sofas, uh, love seats, so that people can have a place to gather, um, even, you know, small meetings. Um, the area is very comfortable. Uh, we chose these fabrics that you see on the screen, um, the patterned fabric, and then the solid fabric will have kind of a mix, depending on the location um, of the seating there in the lobby. And then the inspiration photos, that is the style of chair and sofa that we selected for the lobby. Um, the the um, overflow seating that you see kind of in the center, there's about 50 chairs, um, and there is a, t a TV on the wall that those chairs face. Um, those will be in storage um, unless they're needed for an event or a meeting. And then moving on to the chamber area, uh, we, I've, as you well know, you kind of had some uh, samples of, of chairs that we brought over for you. So that is the uh, chair that was selected for the dais. And then for the chamber seating, we have what is called a Dhoni stackable chair uh, so that we can remove them easily and put them into the storage area if needed. Um, then the fabrics that are shown here are, is what has been selected for um, the solid fabric is the chamber or the dais chairs, and then the patterned fabric is on the uh, seating, the guest seating. 
And going into the offices, um, this is the st uh, standard style of desk that was selected. Um, it has a, the finish is actually exactly what is shown here. Um, it's called a Dolce Vita and a charcoal. Um, and each desk has a small filing cabinet underneath. Um, and then we also have the uh, task chairs or, or desk chairs um, selected there. And then there are some guest chairs in the offices um, if anybody has people coming in for meetings or check-ins. Again, same type of stackable chair, slightly different fabric. <laughs> this, this is for showing you the open office areas, uh, which have uh, slightly different finishes on the uh, desk and uh, storage systems, and then they will have the panels around them, which is a fabric panel to help with acoustics. We're also showing on this slide the conference room tables and the conference room uh, chairs. This is moving, showing what we are suggesting for the, uh, the staff lounge area. We, it's the same chair as you saw in the lobby but we have enclosed arms that are upholstered, and we, that's a fun vinyl fabric that's very durable, can easily be wiped down or cleaned, so if people sit in the lounge furniture to eat or drink, it's, it's easy to maintain. We're also showing the same type of stackable chairs at, in a stool version and a chair, but they would be a solid poly chair. Again, easy, clean maintenance on those uh, finishes. And this is the uh, director's offices. Uh, it's the same color wood or laminate. They're all laminate desks as you saw in the individual private offices. It's just all one laminate color, and they will have a bow front desk on the front with the guest chairs and a small table to meet with people when they come in to meet with you. We're also showing the training room, the inspiration photo for the training room, which is really just uh, tables that are easily folded and they can nest out of the way. And then some, uh, I believe they were, the chairs are easily movable and something that would be comfortable to sit in for long periods of time during the training sessions. So to give you kind of just, that's, that's it for the photos, <laughs> uh, but to just to kind of recap a little bit of what we've done, um, we've worked with uh, Chuck. He um, has obviously been receiving inquiries from vendors over the past two years, so he's been keeping track of that. Um, on December 1st of 2021, um, he presented a questionnaire to all those vendors. Um, the questionnaire included, you know, comparable project experience, ability to supply the KI furniture, uh, ability to purchase on state contract, and then their estimated costs and delivery. Uh, the proposals were due from the vendors on 1216 of 2021. We received eight vendors uh, replied. Um, and then the following week on 1221, uh, we had a publicly advertised uh, meeting with a small committee of NOLA, myself, Chuck, and Donna Smith uh, to review those proposals. And from there, we shortlisted two vendors, which was uh, Commercial Design Services, CDS, and Ernie Morris. Uh, from there, we provided those two vendors with floor plans, kind of what you saw here as far as the layout of furniture to actually provide a hard quote. Um, and then on 1-3 uh, of 2022, we uh, met to review those two proposals, and the decision was made uh, to go with CDS as a preferred vendor based on primarily their costs of delivery and installation. The furniture price were both quoted on state contracts, so they were very similar. <laughs> um, and then in January, we worked together, um, NOLA and I and CDS, to pull samples. And then at the end of January, we had a larger committee um, go, go to the library to kind of take a look at finishes and give feedback on finishes, which you saw here, um, fabrics, styles, chairs, chair comfort levels, all of those things. Um, and then we've been working with CDS to kind of tweak um, and going back and forth on their, on their proposal. They've been wonderful with all of my changes. 
<laughs> so there are likely a few changes that we still need to make with the proposal I did attach. Um, so that's why we were asking uh, for approval of a not to exceed amount of 701,000, which was the amount uh, provided by uh, less in the um, City Hall project financing plan back in March of 2021. And okay. Yeah. Thank you for all your hard work. We really appreciate sure. that. And it's neat to hear that our employees got kind of a say in, or whoever, a group of them anyway, got kind of a say in what they wanted to see and what would make their environment be comfortable and have good, you know, efficiency. Any questions for Nicole or Jennifer? Well, you know the inspiration? Um, you had an inspiration picture. I think it was at St. For the lobby. For the lobby. Who, was that our lobby or was that an <laughs> no. inspiration? No, that's yeah. just St. A, Luke's or somebody I can't see yeah. that far. But, you know, I just had this brainstorm. Uh-oh. Art. Remember. No. Time. You know that little recessed place that is in your inspiration? You know. That looks like a concession stand to me. Me yeah. too. Why don't we have a co little coffee, hot tea, uh, uh, <laughs> Jorge? <laughs> uh oh, he's hitting the he's hitting the ground. But you know, wouldn't it be great to go into City Hall and say, "Oh, I can get a great cup of coffee and um, a pastry or something." I agree. How I and I think they're. Pro I mean, we certainly could explore an opportunity. I've seen a lot of like coffee carts. Yeah, correct. you know that could be something. We certainly cannot at this point change the envelope of the building. I'm not even going to look behind idea. me. No, he, no, you can feel the daggers coming back your head. He's having a breakdown. Yeah. We know that. But I mean, you know, thank God Jorge doesn't have a microphone. <laughs> I can't help it. What do you think? Well, and I will say the, you know, the staff, there is a staff waiting area and then there's also the staff lounge and the lounge is, you yeah, know, very comfortable. It's got like a thing. bar seat. It's got refrigerators. There's, you know, it's got coffee there. So, I mean, there is a, there, it will be a fun area for the staff. But it's um, not open to the, no, but it's but, not yeah. open to the public. Oh, so. And so if you sure. came in, had a, could get a nice mm -hmm. latte, you might feel better about going to pay for your permit. <laughs> Uh, we uh, we have plenty of coffee vendors in the city. I'm sure somebody would be happy to fill that. Thank you. Okay, Mo has something to add to that. <laughs> no, I was just going to add that actually I had this image of of the you know the lobby area being you know Wi-Fi. People can come in there and work, have coffee, whatever. Um, is it carpeted in the lobby or is it what kind of flooring is that? It's terrazzo. So that's good. So it would clean up. Yes, yeah. very okay, easily and very endurable. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So yeah, so I think I had the similar thought. Um, uh oh, vice mayor. Which yeah, it's very frightening. But well, you all can work on that. Commissioner <laughs> yeah. um, Tornga, any questions? Uh, I did or? not have a similar thought on that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, so I, I I like the concept that the that the the folks that are working with us have an opportunity to go and enjoy that kind of thing. Um, I think we have other other restaurants, etc., and perhaps even here. Um, for that kind of activity and the rest of it. Uh, but you asked for my comments, so I gave it. Thank you. You said um, you had another question, Mom? I have, I have a couple questions. Um, so the stackable chairs for the chamber, um, you know, they're, uh, yeah, where are we at with that? Okay, so so basically that, that blue kind of colored line type thing, pat fabric is going to be in them. Mm -hmm. I mean, my biggest thing is, are they going to look good and are they going to be comfortable? For people so we we had pulled those that ch that specific chair as well as several other to sit in in the chamber um, we liked um, well the committee I should say uh, voted uh, for this chair uh, it will be having an upholstered seat and an upholstered back um, so it's kind of that smaller picture there um, and then there are several chairs that we place throughout the chamber that actually will have a um, tablet. a tablet arm so for oh, staff yeah that's, that's cool. that was what I was gonna add that was just to suggest you know when I go to the county and sit in those meetings for four hours mm -hmm. I need a place to put my drink yeah, yeah. so we we uh, I think we actually selected 24 with the tablet arm and we'll kind of spread them out um, to you know for people who need to use or who will be working all day like Paul and Jorge um, in the chamber <laughs> or for guests 
As so, far as those chairs go, if I may, there's no place to go but up as far as comfort. Oh, yeah, yeah. There, there isn't, but yeah. <laughs> there isn't. But I mean, I just didn't want to compromise. I mean, I know they need to be stackable, but mm -hmm. then you also don't want to compromise. I mean, it is the citizens you want. We don't want to be lit, sitting in the lap of luxury and they're like, you know, really uncomfortable. No, there is. Or that they don't look good as they oh, lay no. out. No, I, I, I mean, as I'm not as concerned about the look. I mean, we've spent a lot of time, a lot of time on colors, um, but they do have like a little give in the back, they so do. they are they are it pretty comfortable. Flex back, yeah. so it will give with you. Especially um, larger people, it will give a little bit more, like this chair. Right. <laughs> I'm just demonstrating. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the seat, actually, the ones that you see in the top photo, those are the solid poly or solid plastic. And you can see the seat is fairly deep of a seat mm -hmm. when it's solid plastic. All that would be filled with the foam that would be upholstered. So it is, it, to speak to what Jennifer said, it is a lot more comfortable than what's here and a lot more f uh, foam that right. that you and then we'll that probably put people to sleep because we're very capable of that. <laughs> well they don't recline they don't <laughs> recline no right. we we did sit in all of them and that was the most comfortable one okay good good i feel good about that yeah okay. i had a, i had about four people helping me mm. decide because yeah. i kept hopping between them and they finally said don't you really like this one mm. i go well i don't know i guess but you know what i love you should i love the bright Bright colors. I mean, they make people happier. You know, using some, and, and I have no issue with vinyls that are clean, mm -hmm. that you can clean out. And, you know, I like, I love the, the bright colors. Me too. Okay, yeah. come on, guys. We got it. We got to yeah, move so, this along. So, and I agree. I mean, I looked at the lobby and it looked kind of drab, but then I looked at the colors you picked. It looks great. Um, my one other question is, and what was your name again? I'm sorry. Nola. Nola. So, Nola, you used the term cost effective like five times, uh -huh. which always makes me a little nervous that it's so cost effective that we cut some corners. Uh, no. Okay. No, I can I just want to ask you. you that. We did not. I mean, we it. like cost effective, but it's a, what, $20 million? project so I want nice you no, know, I this, want people to this manufacturer like I said we have it in our offices um, it's a very durable manufacturer they are very attentive to their client to their end users and so you'll have wonderful service from them but no no corners were cut um, awesome. they are they are very they've been around for a long time um, they're American based up in um, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. So, th no corners were cut at all. I can assure you of that. Right. And and I think you know Nola had stated for the desks and the case goods, um, that's a lifetime warranty on those items. Mm -hmm. And then for the chairs, it's a very long time yeah. <laughs> that you would have to sit in and out of it like right. uh, five hundred thousand times. Or <laughs> yes, and we would never. I would never recommend a product that I didn't feel comfortable you using it for. A long period of time because I understand that it'll it'll go out of style long before it actually needs to be replaced if you catch my drift so mm -hmm. I would never recommend a product that would not hold up to what you need Great. no thank you good job Jeff any questions or comments uh, I I do agree with the, the lobby and it's the people's house it's a, a people's place to get a cup of coffee cool that's all I'll say about that uh, concerned about the chamber chairs like everybody else is and I know that we have people that sat in them did you sit in them for two minutes or did you sit in them for two hours and there's a big difference between comfort for one minute and two minutes versus an entire commission meeting it was pretty much in and out two minutes yeah it, it, and I and I will say we you know I mean, Nola can speak because she knows where, you know, the use of these chairs. But I went down and I toured uh, Manatee County property appraiser, had redone their offices um, fairly recently. Um, and they had a lot of this of similar furniture. Um, and they had these, you know, same types of chairs in their offices. So, and I, I as far as I know, I know that everybody at Manatee County was very happy um, with the product and with the service. We actually had a KI rep there with us um, that was kind of showing us around. Yes, I've never, um, these are very pop, the chairs, the Dhoni, they're very popular, one of their more popular models that they sell, um, and I've never known of anybody uh, thinking that they were uncomfortable, especially with the upholstered seat. Okay. <clears throat> and it's just it's very important that the, the people feel that they're welcome here as opposed to state your business and leave. 
kind of, kind of feel. So but that's all I'll say. Thank you. Anything else on this side? John, anything? Um, Jennifer, I did have a question mm. that I didn't ask yesterday because I just thought about it, and that was um, when we do our workshops, you know, at one point, and this may have changed and I just don't know, at one point we talked about being able, because all these chairs are removable in the chambers, that we would be able to have work workshops in there with different furniture in it. But I also am looking at your conference room on a different, your con conference rooms in a different area. What, is it still the plan that we would be able to, because we've all talked about this over the years. I mean, Dave Eggers was talking about it back in the day, the ability to be kind of, you know, facing each other instead of so official here mm -hmm. and having that ability, um, you know, where we're, like we're gonna do at the library with the strategic planning. Is there furniture allotted for that? So well, actually it's the same furniture that's movable. You can, you can, you know, build a big square or something like that for a workshop, which is really what we were talking about. Right, what about so, the tables that are gonna build the square? So, I mean, there aren't tables that we have indicated in the chamber. I mean, we can certainly- No, help. I know. Well, that's, that's why I'm asking. Right. That is why I'm asking, because <laughs> I'm assuming it would be here. Mm -hmm. I would suggest, um, and maybe Jorge would be a good one, the uh, county just redid a big conference room in their um, uh, did, yeah. communications building, which is kind of now where the commissioners are meeting, but it's also where a bunch of other boards are meeting. Mm -hmm. It's pretty rock star, and they've got all the film ability, you know. And it all it is is tables, right. but it, but then it has areas for other people to be sitting there. It sounds it sounds very similar to the tables that we have in the training room, right? Um, where they're they're they are yeah, they're actually more substantial than that. But I'm I I, I just where's that. The communications building across the street from the courthouse. Oh yeah, on the back side. Oh, yeah. I just want to make sure that we haven't lost sight of that. No, nope. because we've always wanted to be able to do that in City Hall instead of going to another building. You know, and when I look at the conference rooms, it's it, it's great for just us, but it's not great if you're inviting the public mm -hmm. to be able to sit in there and have breathing room. Well, the other part of that obviously is that our workshops are televised. So. Well, yeah, and I'm assuming you don't have the cameras in our conference rooms. Right. So, so that's, have to be that's why I'm bringing this up. So I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of our ability. And I, I, what they've done in the communications room is, is, is great. It, very nice, very comfortable, spread out, can mm -hmm. see a lot of people. So, well, I, I, okay. I, I mean, I will, I will say, you know, and I think if you, we have that flexibility, if you have the do not exceed price indicated or approved right. Right. there, yeah. um, we, ha we do certainly have some room in the budget. Um, we made some significant cuts um, from the first version we got a few weeks ago. So I, I think there's an opportunity we can take a look at some table options um, to see what that would look like to be able to set up a square in the chamber. Yeah, and, and to give space for the public to still be in there as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm sure Sue would have to have a, a say in, you know, camera placement and how big these things could be for camera angle and all that stuff. I just want to make sure we're not losing sight of that. that's something that was really important, at least to the commission a few years ago. Absolutely. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve um, up to seven? We've already approved that, but this is the contract, right? Yes, you, you approved the 701,000 in March 24, or on March 24th, 2021, but we're just asking to approve not to exceed 701,000 with the vendor to purchase the furniture. To give you flexibility. Yes, please. Can so I have? Moved. Okay, Commissioner Franey. Second. Vice Mayor Kynes. Any feedback from the public? Okay, seeing or hearing none, any final comments? No. Mm -hmm. All right, and you, you got that? discussion about those tables or whatever yes okay um, well laser eyes coming in. <laughs> okay this could be really quick you know what we do have so m many wonderful um, coffee places in town they might want to to they might hear this and decide that they might want to come and say we'd help you know put this space in to lease it from you uh, so that we could have this but some sort of public-private partnership all right, we can we can go do that later. 
I'm sorry, Deb. We just we got to go. We're okay. already five minutes over, and that was just, just one item. I just don't want to lose Thank my you. train of thought. Okay. Can I? Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Motion passes unanimously. We have the cedarwood and linwood culvert replacement. Bruce, make this short and sweet, please. I will. We were, this is the item we're asking you to award the bid bid number 22-1201 to Civil Earth Site Work Inc. of Bushnell in the amount of $677,000 to construct the uh, capital improvement project at Cedarwood Lynnhurst. The uh, project very simply is to replace four failed drainage pipes that are under Lynnhurst and also to do remedial maintenance work of the downstream ditch. Okay, any questions for Bruce? Okay, any public input? All right, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, Vice Mayor Kynes, Commissioner Tornga, thank you. Any final comments? Nope. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Then we have the Salon Avenue Force Main and Fiber Optic Improvements Project. Um, Paul. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm here with uh, both uh, Michael Nagy and Matthew Woodham. Um, really quick, uh, the finance part of this, um, this is a kind of a joint venture between um, Public Works and uh, the IT Services uh, Department to uh, replace a, an aged for force main from uh, lift station 20 and, um, and also do some work uh, fiber optics uh, to run that up to the EOC. And we're gonna kind of co-locate those things. We put a, a budget amendment in, we've got money coming from both the Public Works side and from the ARPA uh, funding that the commission approved earlier. I'm going to throw it over to, to Matt to talk about the force mate. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Matt Woodham, senior engineer with the engineering division. Uh, this project will encompass uh, the replacement of 3,300 feet of sanitary force main in the same alignment as the proposed 9,500 feet of fiber optic conduit and fiber optic line uh, that share a tr common route through Solon Avenue. And Michael Nagy will speak to that. Um, it is recommended that the construction contract be awarded to CK Contract and Developers LLC in the amount of $1,066,980.99. And any fiber optic questions can be answered by Michael. Anything you want to add, Michael? Unless you want to know the route or what no. facility to be connected? Well, it's the EOC, right? Sorry? It's the EOC. Yes. Yeah. It'll connect the EOC, Parks Operation Facility, Belcher Ro Road Water Tanks, and Lift Station 20. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, any questions for either of these two departments? Nope. Okay. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Commissioner Franey, Commissioner Gao. Any public input on these items? Seeing or hearing none. Any final comments? Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, gentlemen. Gotta say it, brief and brilliant. Uh, okay, right. commission travel to Toronto. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna seek out Commissioner Franey as our liaison. Um, do you have any opening comments that you wanna make towards this or <clears throat> any desire that, uh, of what you want to see occur? Uh, no, not really. I mean, um, obviously, uh, the trip has been booked with the Chamber for June 2nd to June 5th. I intend to go. Um, Peg will go on her own dime, of course. Um, but uh, uh, I don't really have anything to add. I know that this is really a discussion about is there if there anyone else that seems to want to go or what would be the um, anybody that wants to be part of that entourage, so to speak, with the Chamber. Mm -hmm. Vince, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I didn't. Okay. I had nothing more to add. Nothing to add. Okay. I mean, I know Clearwater pretty much sends their whole group. They go. And um, I guess my question to you is, are you going to reach out to what we tried to do when we did our agreement with the county, you know, the chair of the county, which is rolling all the time, usually goes with Philly, go to Philadelphia with uh, Clearwater, and what we were trying to do was get the vice chair to then that particular year to come with us as a way to like always have that a trip. It has never been established 
Who's the vice chair? I don't even know. Uh, I don't know. Charlie's the, vice, the, uh, chair. Charlie's the Charlie chair. I don't know who's the vice chair now. I really don't. don't but I say that because we need to get that back up and running. We need to get somebody from the county to be going, you know, and understand what they see and do. If they're going to Philly, they should be going to Toronto. That's important to me anyway. Well, I mean, uh, Vince showed us the money. I mean, I think it probably pertains to each of us to make uh, a decision on how we want to spend our budgetary monies is what I look at it. I mean, you have that much. Do you want to spend it or not? And then my second question is, uh, when is the that next? That wasn't a question. That was a statement. Oh, okay. My second question is, is the next time, when is the next time, this is a real one, uh, representatives uh, will be traveling to Scotland? Well, that's what we've been trying to talk about. So, well, there's kind of two things we've been thinking about. One is, you know, our band is going to be competing for grade one. I believe they are going this year, but they don't believe this year will be, you know, a year. It's going to be highly competitive. So I was kind of thinking maybe next year, see how this year goes when they go over. And I was kind of thinking about maybe next year. And then, of course, you have to figure out if you're going for the band, the, band's in, the band competition is Glasgow, and Sterling is in a different part of the country. So you have to kind of... Janet Long's the vice chair. Oh, she's been. Mm -hmm. 2022 vice chair. Just so, yeah, just so yeah. I wanted you to know. Um, so it's, you know, trying to figure out how do you pull all of that off. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the band has told, anyway, me that this isn't, um, this probably wouldn't be the year. Because I know that they actually have asked me to go, uh, especially as a liaison to the schools to get an idea of how the schools run their piping programs and what that looks like over there. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we're talking about Toronto, and I know that we're short on time. Oh, they've asked you to go this year? Uh, yes. Yeah. Who we talked about Vancouver. Oh, right, and, and they're... And, and, and Vancouver is kind of out because it's, it's too far away from Toronto. That was right. the second piece. Right. It was like, could we go when we do the Toronto trip to then go where they're going to participate in the North American? Right. And this year it's in Vancouver versus in Ontario. So, like, none of them really work for a joint trip. <coughs> Bless you. <coughs> Sorry. Bless you. It's the oak. Yeah, I've, I've been, my nose has been um. running. So, now I'm totally confused. Where, where is the band? Uh, well, they're we, going to where Glasgow. The world's are Glasgow. Glasgow. Glasgow in August. Right. In Glasgow in August. And, and that was the question Did we I have that uh, availability to decide how we might want to, to use our money? Well, I, I mean, here I think we do, but I think our, because of past actions many 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 years ago they've put this as part of our board rules procedure so that it's publicly talked about and well yeah and you know I'll be honest I lived through those years mm -hmm. where you know you're afraid to take a bite of a hot dog right um, and it was it got to the ridiculous and it hurt relationships because it's really all about you know maintaining yeah. the relationships for business purposes for the good of the community but it, it got it got pushed to a different tone, but I'm always still, you know, want to be aware that we're spending in some some cases we're spending taxpayers' money, which I think this is a great conversation. How do we kind of split up what makes sense to use funds to support things that are important? Like I think what you're bringing up, Jeff, is great, right. um, and I think you know I think it's important to have presence at at the Blue Jay, and of course we all went for when it was the 25 year agreement. But I, to me, it's, it's up to our commission to decide, you know, what's the right balance of taxpayer money and what uh, us as ambassadors ought to be. See, and I, I would love to see us, um, you know, if, if all goes well this year. And, you know, COVID has been an issue, too, and borders and this, that, and the other thing. 
I mean, I would love to see us as a group maybe go to Scotland next year. Oops. It will have been... 19, 2019. However, I will not be here next year. Well, you can come with us. So, I mean, it is sort yeah, of no, poignant I... for me yeah, no, know, to I make know. a decision well. about, you know, because I haven't spent any money going anywhere just like y'all for what, how many years now? Mm -hmm. So even if I paid part of my way, I, you know, which mm -hmm. I'd be happy to, I think maybe it, 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 we each have the same amount of money that we can spend to choose to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if, if that is not appropriate, then I think we need to spell that out, you know, or, or something. But, I mean, what Vince has provided, you have this much amount in your little budget and then you have this much amount in a training budget so okay well right now we're talking about Toronto right that's the purpose of this piece um, to be honest I haven't even I haven't really made a decision about it I, yeah, I kind of felt like you're our liaison I didn't see something substantial going on to, you know, I was going back and forth. I mean, Clearwater pushes the entire commission to go. They really do. Now, Actually, they don't always go. Yeah. Right. And so that's why I came Even to you. I don't know if that's something you want to, maybe you're not ready to discuss that. I talked about it a few years ago, but maybe that's something you want to bring up next year. I mean, I do think it shows. Our support. You know, solidarity. Um, given that that's what they do. And they have a pretty big staff contingent that goes as well. But I don't care this year. I, uh, given that... Um, we don't even know where... Well, yeah, we I mean, don't even know when the season's that. starting. So it's kind of like... Some expert just... It's kind of how I feel about Scotland. That nobody knows what's going on. Yes, Commissioner um, Torner. No, I mean, the biggest issue here is the Chamber's ready to rock and roll. No, and they need to. They're holding slots for us because they give us priority. So they, they need to know right. who wants to go and who doesn't want to go. Uh, and I, you know, I don't disagree yeah. with Commissioner Kynes. You know, we have travel and education funds that we've budgeted, and we each choose what seems to be appropriate for and, and what we do, we how we blend that. in years mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. We have not used them no, for we have years. Not matter of fact, we took a cut in them during the pandemic, if you recall. Yeah. Commissioner Torgo? I'll just, I'm going to make it, I was going to say, I'm going to t uh, make a comment exactly how I had planned to say it, but I will add that other point, just because it's in the budget doesn't, I mean, obviously doesn't mean we have to spend it ever. We all know that. Um, but my input was to say that I thought perhaps you should go, someone like you should go. The rest of us maybe want to take a step back. We don't know what's going on with baseball yet. We got other issues worldwide and we're just coming off the pandemic um, so we need to plan it we need to tell the chamber what we're what we what we're going to do and and that was just my input and I don't want to influence anybody else's if they if they really thought they needed to go or if but I'm willing not to go um, simply and have you represent me then or us mm -hmm. um, I think that's a that would probably be a good decision we have so many things going on right now um, so that, that was what I, I just wanted to yeah. say. If that helps anybody else, if it doesn't, that's fine. I, but I, I, would, I would be supportive of someone like you going in this case and, and me not. And not only to save the money, but, uh, and to save the money, but, but just because there's so many things going on and we're coming off the pandemic and we're coming into other things. We got fuel prices going crazy. Airlines are gonna be, if you wanna get a ticket, you might wanna get it quick. And Jennifer, you'll determine what staff or whatever should be going. Yeah, Mayor, at this point, Vince and I are planning on going okay. for business meetings. Um, I went to Toronto my, my first year on the commission. I found it incredibly valuable to go. Uh, I don't know that I need to go this year to Toronto. I'm, so I'm fine with just letting uh, Mo go. Mo go. Mogo. 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 Go Go Mo. Go Mo. Go Mo. Go. And I'm separately funded, so right. it's just an easy, it's an easier piece, but right. Right. Uh, I'm on the horns of dilemma. 
I didn't know Dilemma had horns. Look, I, I, I think it's a personal you can, choice. You can, I, 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 don't th I, I think you're fine if you want to go, and you're fine if you don't want to go. I, it, yeah, and if you want to think about it, I don't think we have to... Yeah. I don't think we have to tell you you should or shouldn't. But so I really don't feel that way. I, and I, I right. you know, I think we know that our yep. our liaison is she's going liaison. and keeping things Absolutely. going. And there's certain things she's working on. I know, you know, I think everybody's got a purpose. Um, this is your last year here. I, I think there's nothing wrong with you going. And it and, does show, it does show, you know, having an extra commissioner there. It just yeah. shows support, which is important. They're a huge, I mean... Then two of, you can, tell, two of you can tell why one of the rest of us aren't there. Yeah. And we're going to speak for you, though, you oh, know, because right. you just said we could, yeah. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. You got two well, of us. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm fine with <laughs> Commissioner Kynes going. I'm fine with okay. anybody who wants to go to go. I, 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 yeah, I don't care one way yeah, or another if I you all want to go. I, I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm saying truthfully, if, you know, after 18 years, if there's one place I would have I'm loved Scotland. to have gone was Scotland. Yeah. Oh. But, you know. That's, you know, that's the truth. And can, I think the pandemic we, really, because I think we would have gone again, even though it was in our four-year window. Want to have another discussion? Because our four-year window isn't until, like, next year, I think. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. Mayor, can we, can we deal with Toronto today, but can we put a Scotland trip on, the, on, on the an the agenda? agenda? I think it is going to come on the agenda, isn't it? Because we did say we should do the same thing with the Scotland trip as we're doing with it's the... As part of the regular budget process. Right. Oh, it's yes. the budget. So, so it's a uh, so trip the is not budget. trip is not in the budget this year. Correct. Because that's a lot of more money, and that's right. an extra allotment. Correct. Right. So we, well, the last Scotland trip, it was budgeted, I believe, the year before. Right. Yeah, it was. And because my thought process in looking at the Toronto and Scotland is was the same amount of money, and it's and, not. And, but but but, but I I'd, I'd be willing to. Take what's in the budget this year, and everything else would be uh, on me. Mm. Well, you know me also. I mean, I'm very, very, very willing to pay my share. Um, um, you know, the le when you all went to Scotland, I thought that that was part of a trip that was a private trip, so that somehow you could mm -mm. work. No, we did the trip with the businesses, like the Toronto trip is. But I, I got to cut everybody off. We've got five minutes to get through everything. Let's put the Toronto or the Scotland trip on the next Discussion. open yeah. agenda, just so yeah. we can have this further dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I, we didn't think we were. Gonna, I didn't know that we were going to talk about that. And we've got five minutes to be. I figured Toronto was going to be a discussion, though. But, but I do think whoever, if you're going to go, we just need to let Jennifer know. I mean, either I or you, we need to let the chamber know. Right. Yeah. Which, of course, the Toronto trip You're is talking about the more Toronto than just trip. yeah. The Toronto trip is more than just the um, it, it's more than just the game. It's no, also it's, it's a, a chamber message. event too. You, you, right. You know, it's I, a chamber event. It's supporting it's the supporting chamber. Supporting our businesses. So. Okay. But anyway. All right. I don't think there's a motion that needs to be made. I think we're all in consensus that at least Mo will go. If anybody else wants to go to the Toronto, feel free. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Proposed agenda. Um, everybody okay with that? I mean, the only thing that we'll need to add is a presentation for the Tartan Day proclamation. I had a gotcha. Yeah, hey, oh. Jeff will have his kilt on. I know it. Huh. Okay. All right. Can I have a motion to approve? So moved. So moved. Second. Okay, Vice Mayor and Commissioner Franey. Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I'm going to go right to Nikki. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to report that our office did receive the title report back on the root deed for the church property that you requested. It does go back to a defunct trust dating back to 1932. So we are seeing what we can find out about the trust and then also going to reach out to Father Bob to see what documentation, if any, that the church has with regard to the church, with regard to the trustees. Um, and their secession, and then we'll report back to you on what the city's options are with regard to a, you know, historical stuff. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Mayor, for that time to let you all know that the title report was back and we're cranking along. <laughs> Just a quick question on that, because it's the historical piece, but also I know Father Bob wants to do work there. And he can't really do a permit if he doesn't. So I guess that's all wrapped into that, though, right? Kind of. 
Right. The city's interest was in filing the historical application, which is why we're doing the title search. But you're right. This could, I guess, serve as a tangential benefit to allowing the property owner to also submit permits validly. They did do a notice of commencement, though, back in 2021, which was accepted by their contractor. So there are, you know, they have a notice of commencement recorded for that time, but it's not the secession is not clear of the trustee. Okay, Jennifer, you have anything you want to let us know about? Not this morning, Mayor. Uh, <laughs> Bet you don't. Rebecca? <laughs> She's like, I'm done. No? That was pretty good. Anything else for the good of the order from everybody? Three minutes to spare. Well, we're not done yet. Somebody's <laughs> going to say something, so. Uh, well, I just, I would just like to bring up that I, uh, I'd like to ask Jennifer just to quickly brief us on the progression of the overlay, uh, what, what agencies will be talking to, um, that's it? Right now or in the future? You can do it Thursday. I'll, I'd be happy to do it Thursday. I can I can give you a, a brief overview now if you'd like. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Wait till the second. Okay, so. Great. <laughs> all right. We had the community input meeting. Uh, the community input meeting, I'm not sure how beneficial that was for the community itself. And so we did send a follow up letter. Um, Excuse me, we did post a follow-up letter um, regarding that community meeting and some of the uh, information that we thought needed to be um, uh, corrected or provided additional information as well. This item is scheduled for a special meeting of the local planning agency on March 22nd. Uh, I have directed staff to, to provide, and the city commission did as well, real-life examples of what staff's recommendation is going to be as part of the presentation and to address some of those questions that were brought up during the course of the community meeting. And then it will be first and second reading. This is the ordinance establishing the overlay and also the, the, the overlay and the South Douglas overlay, that specifically, and then the overlay um, uh, criteria essentially in the, in the land development code. So um, that will, then will go for two readings before the city commission in April. And then the, uh, the zoning of progress will sunset uh, at the end of April on April 30th, I believe. And LPA? Is March 22nd, special March meeting. Thank yeah. you. I just want it to come to us and feel like I know what I'm voting on. Yes. Right? Because mm -hmm. right now the geometry figures don't work for me. You know, it's got to be real. What are we really going to look like? What are we really going to achieve? So right. And I did uh, uh, ride out with George Kinney last Friday uh, to look at several structures, several buildings, and talk about uh, what staff's recommendation is going to be vis-a-vis -vis Kimley Horn's proposal. You know, so, so we need to keep it uh, simple. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and make sure that, that, that obviously the five of you and the community thoroughly understand what staff's recommendation is going to be. And visual. C visual. C City manager, is there any way that, that we could have that before the yes. 22nd? Uh, like maybe Thursday night that we could actually see something like that so that others can then also see it? I know that's preliminary. Well, we won't be ready this Thursday. Okay. For it. But okay. uh, that said, um, I, I do want to convene a meeting with all of you. This will be individually uh, okay. to go over the PowerPoint presentation and staff's recommendations. So we'll be working on that. Is there, is there any way you could do anything on Thursday just to give it over an overview, or, you, or am I begging the question? We're still over. a little bit early. Yeah, I, I think okay. we can't do it. I'm sorry, okay. Commissioner. No, no, thank you. Know we're a little early. No, thank you. Okay, anything else from anybody? Nope. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin. Follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.